So, um, let's start over here. So, the, the biggest physical object that's part of the thing is just this service cart. And these service carts come in two sizes. They come in a 36 by 24 inch version, and they come in a 30 by 16 inch version. But the measurements of all of the parts otherwise are pretty much identical. Um, and uh, the Z height is identical. So it makes it really easy. Basically, the same laser cut parts um, work for either model. Um, and so it just depends on how much space you have. I live in a converted shuttle bus called the Magic Tool Bus. And I'm trying to be able to travel around and teach people how to uh, trash bin and also just be able to utilize my own trash and ideally other people's trash um, in order to, um, and, and in order to do that, I need a mini version. So there's going to be two bits of two versions of the trash printer version three. There's the trash printer regular and the trash printer mini. Um, so this one was the first one, um, like the first test of this sort of setup. Uh, and like, uh, to be honest, it works surprisingly, or it surprised me <laughs> that it works. Um, and, uh, but I built it, uh, over last winter, um, sort of in bits and pieces. So I've never been able to put the whole thing together, uh, in just one go. Um, and so this is sort of like the new iteration and there are some updates, uh, to the parts, um, compared to this one. The parts are all basically the same. I'm going to start over here and I'm just going to like tap on things and give you a sense of what they are. Um, but again, if you want the quantities or the exact parts list, uh, go check out the Hackney documentation. So you got the service cart. This is 16 by 30. You've got four um, 5 16 uh, by 24 inch threaded rods, which sort of holds everything together. Uh, I upgraded, these are all like a slightly nicer rolling casters and they all lock and they all swivel. Um, but you don't have to use those, I just like them. Um, and you can just use the casters that come with the uh, service cart. And then uh, you've got uh, power input. You've got an extension cord that will be ultimately what plugs into the wall. Uh, you've got a 24 volt power supply. Um, this one's three amps and that's the minimum that you want. I'd recommend getting a five or six amp 24 volt power supply. Um, and then you've got a, um, Rambo board. Um, it's called a Rambo version 1.4, I believe. Um, I got that from v1engineering.com. Um, cooling fan, two solid state relays, four uh, NEMA 17 stepper motors for the uh, Z axis. I believe these are 80 or 81 ounce, inch it, ounce inch it, inches. Um, if I were to do it again, I'd probably uh, get, there's some that are more like 100, um, but they were pretty great. Um, so four for the Z axis, one for, uh, I guess that's the Y axis, don't quote me on that, uh, and then two for the X axis. And um, then there's various like end stops and thermistors and wire connectors. Um, this is a four splice lever lock connector that I really like. Um, and uh, I was able to put this version entirely together without any soldering or heat shrinking, um, which cuts down on the just overall cable management and just general like skill and, and comfort level with soldering. Uh, that's required to build this because uh, I don't like soldering and also um, I'm constantly trying to figure out uh, how I can sort of like lower the barrier to entry um, and soldering can be kind of daunting especially if you need it to work super well um, the first time you do it. Um, so then over here we've got some 5 16 hardware. Most of the hardware in this build is 5 16 These ones are I believe an inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter, five sixteenths, uh, hex bolts, and their associated five sixteenths uh, nuts. Uh, you can use locking nuts. I don't, and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, then uh, skateboard bearings, 
and some, uh, I believe these are 1032 um, by, well, look up the uh, lengths in the documentation. And there's a little bit of uh, metric hardware, mostly for the stepper motors. You've got uh, seven of the shaft couplers that will uh, attach the motors to the lead screws. Uh, you've got seven lead screws. Two of them, I believe, are around 300 millimeters, 400 millimeters, and then um, one of them is 700 millimeters, and then the Z, um, these ones are 700 millimeters, and we might have to cut them. I think uh, the exact length should be around 600, uh, but that'll all be in the documentation. Um, you've got a shaft cuff coupler for the auger motor. You've got two thermistors for registering the temperature. You've got band heaters for heating the extruder barrel. You've got these um, coupling nuts um, that go with the threaded rods. Um, you've got two quarter 20 by an inch and a quarter uh, hex bolts uh, for holding the bottom part of the extruder uh, onto the top part. Uh, you've got these long, I believe they're something like seven and a half inch or eight inch um, quarter 20 threaded um, hex bolts um, that sort of hold the extruder body together. You've got, this one's a 516 or a 5 8 um, wood auger. Um, I'll go into the details. You can use a lot of different things for these and you get different results. Um, so, um, but that one's uh, 5 8 This is a six inch by uh, three quarter inch NPT brass um, barrel, sometimes called a nipple. Um, and then this is the uh, extruder end. This is a flare couple, coupling that goes from a half inch or maybe three eighths flare to a three quarter inch NPT um, uh, fitting. But then also there's a lot of options for how you want to do that uh, that I'll go into in a little bit. And then this is a three quarter inch NPT pipe flange from a hardware store. Most of this stuff is I used to work at a hardware store, and so it's constantly um, <laughs> designing for things that are easy to find at a local hardware store. Some of the stuff you have to buy online. This is a 3-inch PVC plumbing line. Um, you've got a set of laser-cut parts. Um, these parts are designed to be... Uh, if you laser-cut them, it's faster, but they can also be cut with a CNC router, and they can also be cut out of... Uh, acrylic on a laser cutter, or if you need to and you have a 3D printer, they can be 3D printed, it just takes a while. Um, I've not actually tried that, but I have them in the documentation as SVGs for CNC cutting and then also as uh, STLs for um, 3D printing. So if you do happen to uh, 3D print them, let me know how it goes. Um, and then finally, a uh, 15 to 1 planetary reduction NEMA 23 stepper motor, uh, and that's the big powerful one that um, moves uh, the material down through the hopper into the barrel and then out the tip. And so that's not, that's sort of the abridged version, look at the parts list for all the details, but that's all you need to build this trash printer. Um, and so we'll go into each bit, but I'm gonna move these things out of the way and then I'm going to start assembling the extruder. Oh, I guess I'll go over the um, tools that you need. Uh, you might need some additional tools, um, but the tools that you will definitely need are, this is a tubing cutter. Um, you can also use a hacksaw or however you want to do it for cutting the metal rails. Oh, <laughs> speaking of cutting metal rails. Um, the, this version is designed to use exactly one inch diameter um, rails for the um, roller bearings to roll along. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, low rider in that way. Um, these ones are stainless steel, brushed stainless steel. I've also used aluminum. These ones are aluminum. They work fine. I've also used wood. Um, obviously, the um, stainless steel ones are going to be um, more rigid, uh, but any one inch diameter material will work. Um, and um, 
but you'll generally have to cut them. So you want a tubing cutter so you can cut them. Um, this is just all purpose adjustable wrench. Um, this is a like a ratchet nut driver. Uh, and then this is a 7 16th uh, bit and that will fit the quarter 20 hardware. And then this is a half inch bit uh, and this will fit the um, 5 16 hardware. Uh, you're gonna want wire cutter and strippers. Um, just normal Phillips screwdriver. Uh, a step drill bit set uh, is great for cutting or drilling the holes into the plastic. Um, and then a metric uh, sort of hex Allen key set. And then um, just for in terms of power tools, you don't need much, um, but we're going to cut the top out of uh, this top um, part of the service cart. And so you're going to want a, uh, I like to use a jigsaw. This is a jigsaw attachment for this sort of multi-tool that I have, but uh, an electric jigsaw works great. Um, and then you're also going to want a power drill. Um, but if you have those tools, which are pretty common tools, um, then you should have everything you need to start trash printing. I should also say that the trash printer requires um, shredded up plastic flakes. Um, and I got into this whole crazy project um, after I built the Precious Plastic open source plastic shredder in 2016. Um, and so you will need, if not that shredder, there's a version two and a version three now, um, but if not an open source Precious Plastic um, print or shredder, uh, you'll need some way to grind up and shred the plastic into small flakes. Darcy, do you have the, um, the shred, the test tube shred? Cool. So this is the um, shredded uh, plastic. This is made out of polypropylene test tubes um, that come from a company here in Oregon that tests wine and so they have to use these uh, test tubes and they can only use them once and so uh, it's a very abundant source of uh, single use, very clean, uh, very high quality polypropylene. Polypropylene is number five. It's the plastic that prints by far the best that I've tried. So far I've tried um, polypropylene number five and HDPE number two. Um, useful things can definitely be made out of HDPE. Um, but they are, uh, it's a more challenging plastic. So plan to start with polypropylene. Um, all right. So let's build the extruder. Jesse, would you mind um, if you haven't already sharing the stream to uh, Facebook and then maybe tagging me in it or something and then I can share it to my feed? Sure. Cool. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool.
Um, if you have uh, an iPad or um, just if you're familiar with SketchUp really, um, I designed this whole thing uh, in SketchUp. And so the model is very, very accurate compared to the real world version. Um, and so you can use it as a reference. And I don't know how well you can see this, but I'm sure you can see it somewhat. So um, on the SketchUp warehouse, there is a 3D model that is very detailed that you can at least use for reference. Um, and if you're comfortable with SketchUp, you can also get in there and make adjustments. So you can change hole sizes and stuff, generate your own SVGs, modify the um, uh, design however you want. Uh, this design is fully open source. You can do whatever you want with it. I would be really psyched if you did. Um, I would be really psyched if you did and then shared it. Um, we've got a GitHub going uh, for um, keeping track of both the changes to the um, design files, the STLs and the SVGs, and also the firmware and just the general parts list. And so um, if you're comfortable using GitHub uh, and you make any changes, feel free to uh, participate there and share what you learn. Um, and I guess I should also say, I already met, mentioned precious plastic, uh, but this project I would say is very much inspired by and part of the precious plastic movement, uh, which is sort of a open source worldwide movement of people trying to develop low cost, small scale, plastic trash recycling infrastructure. So if you're not already aware about uh, Precious Plastic, uh, check out the documentation they have and just the community uh, of people who are hacking on this problem all over the world uh, at preciousplastic.com. Um, so we're gonna build the extruder. And um, this, every time I do a new build, I like to try and do it slightly differently and iterate and try and improve or just test different ideas that I have. And so as I'm building this, I'm both going to tell you how I'm currently doing it and how I used to do it. So I'm going to do what I think will work and then I'll tell you about what I know works and, uh, but also how that doesn't work or the ways that I think it could be better. And then you can decide what you want to do. Um, the, something that's uh, important to know, um, is that there's just a lot of different ways that you can put the extruder together. Um, ultimately, it's just a hot tube of metal uh, that's held at just the right temperature for plastic to melt but not burn. Um, and um, so um, I've, I've put all sorts of different types of parts together in order to build these extruders. And uh, they all have different properties and they all perform a little bit differently, but I've never had one fully not work. Um, I guess the one exception to that would be something kind of like this one, which has a very, very small nozzle. Um, I believe this is an eighth of an inch nominal uh, hose bar. Um, and that's what I've used most often is these like brass hose barbs from the hardware store. Um, but um, the internal diameter of this is probably two or three millimeters, still a lot bigger than a typical traditional 3D printer uh, nozzle, you know, that's sometimes in the range of 0.2 millimeters. Um, is that right? 0.2 millimeters? I think that's right. So. Yeah, um, yes, that's correct. And um, so, um, part of the what makes the trash printer work is that um, it can use really dirty actual plastic because real world waste plastic has little bits of labels on it, has little bits of dirt or sand, sometimes food waste on there, and cleaning them um, so well that there's none of that in there. It's just really difficult. And to be honest, I'm not gonna do it. You, you, <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna do. I don't like to do it. And so um, there are many different ways that you can get around that. Uh, but it's kind of why I decided personally to move away from trying to 
make filament out of recycled plastic. Some plastics work a lot better from that. I've heard that PET, uh, which is number one, um, prints pretty well. It's like uh, it's dimensionally stable and, and pretty comparable to other typical 3D printing plastics. Um, but number five, number two, number two and number five, polypropylene and polyethylene, the olefins, um, make up together over 50% of all ha household plastic waste. Um, so that's, that's where a lot of the material is. And um, those plastics are a little bit more difficult to work with, just um, sort of by their nature. They, they have a lot more thermal warp to them. Um, and so um, they're already very difficult to print with, and 3D printing is already quite difficult. Um, and trying to make recycled filament on top of that is just a challenge. And so the way that the trash printer solves that problem is just to have a bigger nozzle so that those things can just pass right through. Um, and so um, I've not really had good luck uh, with a nozzle that's smaller than about three, maybe four millimeters in internal diameter. Um, if you're interested in trying to really get those high resolution prints that are more comparable to what you would think of when you think of a 3D printed part, I would invite you to try. Uh, but I've moved away from that because it just doesn't seem to work. They clog um, or just block. It just doesn't work well in my experience. Um, and so I've tried all sorts of different nozzle sizes uh, and usually just going to the hardware store and seeing what has generally the right shape. And they're used for all sorts of different types of things. This one is a so-called shark bite uh, connector for pets. Um, this one is a garden hose tube uh, to a hose barb. I think that's maybe five eighths uh, hose barb. Um, this one is a garden hose sprayer, um, and uh, this one's a half inch um, NPT to about quarter inch or five eighths um, hose bar. And um, so there's lots of things that you can do. Um, and then um, that also sort of brings me to the size of the barrel itself. So. This is off one of the original trash printers. Um, and this, I started off using a half inch uh, NPT barrel, um, which works fine as long as you um, just you know, match it to the auger that you're using. I actually got this auger uh, used at a um, sort of community restore kind of thing in Portland. Um, and so these types of augers are common, but they're kind of hard to find new, I found. Um, but the half inch barrel works fine. Um, I just um, wasn't getting the throughput that I wanted. Um, and so um, I sort of moved towards uh, using a three quarter inch uh, fatter NPT barrel. Um, and that seems to work better. It certainly doesn't work worse. Um, but then you have to convert from the NBT threads, this is three quarter NPT, um, to whatever fitting you want to uh, use. Um, some of them, like the short bite one, just goes right into a three quarter inch NPT. And some of them, if you want, especially if you want to use the smaller ones, uh, are going to use either a half inch or a three quarter or three eighths uh, inch NPT. Uh, thread and so then you need something like this, which is an adapter. This one is three quarter NPT to one half, um, and so um, and then this one is garden hose to one half. So um, I invite you to experiment with these. Just go to the hardware store and see what looks good. But the one we're going to try and uh, test out today is one that I've not tried before, and it's actually going to be probably one of the widest. Uh, internal diameter nozzles that I've used, uh, which is a three quarter inch MPT to a, uh, I believe, three eighths uh, barb um, for like gas lines. And so um, I like using these ones because then you can just sort of slide 
the um, right size barrel fitting over it, and then that whole barrel or the tip of the barrel there gets um, hot. Uh, and so it makes it so that you don't need a, a heater right at the tip, which is what I was doing before. Um, previously, in some of my previous documentations and in previous iterations of the trash printer, what I've done, um, you can see it sort of here. Um, I started off by using the hot end of a typical 3D printer, just a small aluminum block that has a hole in it for the heater cartridge, a 24 volt uh, DC heater cartridge, um, and a little thread for a thermistor. And what I would do is just drill out the hole a little bit so that it fit the size of the barb that I wanted to um, heat, and I would then tap a small hole here uh, with a, um, I think it was like an M4 or M3 metric screw so that I could tighten it in place. And that worked well enough to get me started, but um, I would prefer if the trash printer could be easily built without having to drill and tap metal. Um, and um, having the tip heater definitely does give you a little bit more control. Um, but um, I've also found that you can totally do it uh, with you can get away with not doing that and so I'm sort of experimenting with the various ways I can get away with not doing that. Um, so um, we're not going to do that. Um, I do have another video uh, up that shows sort of the old way uh, in a little bit more detail um, but we're just going to use two band heaters. It's also worth mentioning that the Trash printer, one of the ways um, that I've sort of gotten it to work is you need a lot more heat to move through the extruder than you typically do uh, with a smaller 3D printer. Um, and so you just need to be able to deliver more power. Um, and so instead of using a heated bed, which I've just probably would help, but uh, is just sort of more of a design challenge than I've gotten to, um, I've just been um, sort of tricking the um, system into treating the first um, barrel, barrel here as a uh, as the heated bed, uh, and it's, so it acts sort of as like a bulk heater. So you've got one right at the tip, and then one just above it. You don't want it too far up the barrel. Um, and uh, this acts as sort of like a preheater and lets you just uh, dial in and give you a little bit more control over the final temperature going out. Um, and so um, this one is a 35 millimeter by 35 millimeter band heater. And this one is a 30 by 20 or 25 by 30 millimeter uh, band heater. The wattage of them doesn't really matter because they'll be modulated by the um, software, uh, but um, I'll post links to those in the official documentation. Um, so, mm -hmm. and then you need a way to hold the metal barrel uh, relative to the hopper so that it can um, direct the plastic, which goes in here, um, and um, keeps it in line with the auger, which goes in the top and pushes the material down, powered by the motor. And so the way that I have done that is by using these laser cut um, spacers um, and uh, these two bolts go up between the two uh, assemblies and they, you tighten them down, they hold the whole thing together and it becomes uh, very sturdy. Um, I should also say that I have actually printed, uh, trash printed the, this bottom assembly. Instead of using multiple laser cut discs, I just actually 3D printed the shape from an STL. Um, and uh, that one is currently in service in this version of the trash printer. So that does work, um, or it seems to, uh, it doesn't not work. 
Um, and so um, the trash printer can, in fact, print at least some of the parts for itself, although we've still got a long way to go before we uh, reach RepRap status. Um, so let's get started uh, assembling this whole thing. And then we'll do the details of how to get the thermistors and barrel uh, like nozzle going. Also, Darcy, if there's anything you hear me say that is either factually incorrect or <laughs> unclear, please let me know. I will uh, let me know if you hear anything. <laughs> cool. Um, I also shared this online and tagged you in it. So oh, great. Cool. People will join in. I'll just take a moment. Excuse me, well, I invite anyone to watch this, so it's not just me talking to myself. Okay. I was like, what, what camera is that? Oh, that's your photo. Oh, um, that post is friends only. So I can share. Oh shoot. Um, let me change it then. Let me go ahead and change it. I can also just copy out the text and send it to you. How do you want to do it? You post it. Let me let me ask you. Stop I can also hand you my phone and do it. Oh, that's crazy. Um. Okay. Yeah, let me just post it. <laughs> cool. All right, so this first set of discs is what I call the bottom assembly. Um, and if you're using quarter inch material, it ends up being about eight parts, although the last three are just copies, they're the same thing. Um, and so, uh, and then about halfway on uh, with the one that I'm calling B4, um, there are these hex holes, and that's where you can drop in these two quarter twenty um, uh, bolts, and they're going to hold the um, metal pipe flange and ultimately the barrel in place. Um, and then we'll have other ones that are going through uh, the top, holding the whole thing together. Um, so the first thing you're going to want to do is take these smaller quarter 20 hex bolts, put them through so they all line up, flip it over, put the last one on here. Um, these uh, hex bolt holes down here are for the ones that will go up and hold the whole thing together. And then these other holes here are so that you have the option, let me see where I put that. Um, if you want the option of doing a half inch um, barrel instead of a three quarters, um, this makes it sort of universal. So um, the, um, they don't fit, they've got different bolt patterns. So, but you can just not use these ones and put the half inch on there. But these um, hex holes let the bolt be recessed so that the flange will sit nicely on top. So if you're confused about why those are there, those are if you want to use a half inch. Um, once you assemble the thing, you may want to put some hot glue in there or um, uh, just plug them up so that plastic doesn't fall through, but it shouldn't be too much of an issue. One important thing to remember is to put these in before you put the flange on.
these this easy. I'm going to use these wing nuts, quarter twenty wing nuts. Um, but you can use whatever fastener you want. And then you can just slide let's see, the rest of the parts. Uh, let's see, it goes the other way. Down onto here. Thanks. And that is at least the first part of the bottom assembly, which will ultimately go in here and go like that. Um, this could be shorter, but depending on the thickness, the exact thickness of your material, um, you'll want it to hang out a little bit beyond here. So for me, that's eight um, uh, discs, and that's why I have the last three are identical, uh, is so you can space them out however you need to, based on the thickness of your material. And sometimes there's some variation in, in these things, although not all that much. Okay, so let's see, now we'll put on the barrel, let me just screw it on there, and for this, both uh, this fitting connection and this connection, they don't really need to be tighter than finger tight. Um, they just like need to not move when the auger moves, but as tight and as hard, um, tight as you can get it with your hand is fine. You don't need to use a tool. Um, and if you ever need to take it apart later, it'll probably be easier. Um, okay. So that's all we need on that side for now. Okay. You want to orient the two bolts so that they are not blocking the uh, input of the material. It doesn't really matter, but it matters a little bit, so you might as well just do it right the first time. Um, and then, similar to the um, bottom assembly, the top assembly is really only two critical parts. There's one that holds the front of the motor, and then there are spacers. And you can use the spacers because depending on which kind of auger you use, you're going to want to control the depth that it goes down into the tube. Um, and I find that you want it outside enough so that it can bite on the material coming in through the hopper. And you really don't need it to extend all the way down. If it gets into the area that is actually melted, the uh, amount of force that it takes for it to move is a lot higher. Um, and so while I do think that if you had a much more powerful motor, uh, that could work, uh, in, in this case with this motor, I find that just having it insert about maybe an inch, uh, plus or minus an inch, um, is usually good enough. And then that leaves about a two or three inch section above that will grab the pieces of plastic and move them down into the barrel. And so that's what creates the forward pressure that just keeps plastic moving out the, the tip. So we'll do this. So for the top assembly, first thing you want to do is um, you're going to want to add the spacers before or after this part. Um, and then there's two ways you can do it. I also, uh, this has not been added to the current documentation, but it will be by the time anyone sees this as a video. Um, this one's sort of like a cap. So you can have this assembly and then you can have as many spacers as you want. And then you can have 
the cap on there, and then the motor assembly. <laughs> and then um, the cap makes it so that it will, this works a lot better when it's assembled, but so it sits on top of that. So it gives you the option of uh, spacing it up a lot higher, or you can just add more spacers below to get it at the height that you want. Um, so, I should also say that one of the design challenges that uh, is, you know, open for interpretation here is I had a really hard time finding a shaft coupler that would reliably go from uh, this size, which I believe is 10 millimeters, to this, which is either 8 or 7.4 millimeters. Um, I just couldn't find a shaft coupler that would go around this hex and make a good solid contact. So I just laser cut ones that are um, shims, basically, and uh, it, it works well enough that I've been doing it for years. Um, and so it's a little hacky, but it works, uh, which means it counts. Uh, and so what I've been doing is just taking one side of this 10 millimeter shaft coupler and pushing these on here, these wooden spacers, like that. And then you can get away with one, but two is better because it makes it deeper and holds better. So then that is the bit that then connects it, uh, the motor shaft to the auger. So, always got to remember the uh, order of operations here. Uh, I think that what I want to do here is put that on the motor first. I'm sure we'll find out in a second if that's right. Um, I only have these two uh, bolts here, but ideally you'd want four, although that one definitely only has two and it hasn't been a problem. Um, This part just sticks in here. Sometimes you might have to really push on it to get it to go in. Um, and then this part, oh, well, that was the wrong shaft size. I'm going to use this one for demonstration purposes that is slightly different because it's an older version, but same idea. And then we'll see where this goes. So that one actually would work pretty well, I think. Maybe it could come out a little bit, so we'll put one spacer in there. Right. 
And then I've been using these little coupling nuts. Um, if you find that these ones are too hard to get down there, which these ones may be, we'll see, um, then um, you may want to add more of these spacers in between um, so that it uh, the coupling nuts stay uh, further up and they're easy to get to with the tool. In fact, I'm going to do that. Probably open the door. You could do that. Thanks. That makes it so you can get the uh, a little bit more of a tool on those coupling nuts. Um, <laughs> we were keeping the door closed because there were flies, uh, but it's too hot in here now. So if the, you see flies, it's not because you smell. Alright. Alright. So then. The more you get in there, the more you can tighten those. That one, this one went the adjustable wrench. Those ones are a little bit thinner than typical than the hex heads of the quarter 20. So just want to tighten those down like that. As you're tightening, make sure that it's mostly um, oriented properly so that you're not blocking that entry hopper. And you don't need to crank these down, just enough so that it feels solid. Um, if you have a problem with it, feel free to tighten it down more. wrong. I did this as a uh, cautionary, you know, educational thing to yeah. like let people know not to do what I just did, which is uh, if you tighten it down before you put in the auger, you 
can't you get a chicken part to put any other. So I, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I get to see you do it twice. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the point. Um, since I have to take a break to do that, I'm going to see if I can find the right shaft coupler. <laughs> it is like, you know, not great for the source video. But we're doing it live. I find it kind of comforting to do it live because, like, this exact type of stuff happens when I'm trying to record it for, like, my perfectly accurate tutorial. Mm -hmm. And then I get all flustered. <laughs> And this is like, well, some people are already watching, so it's like I don't have time to like go back and have to make it perfect, you know? Totally, yeah. Yeah, and it gives other people like kind of like the permission to like take it apart and put it back together. Yeah, this will happens. happen to you, I'm absolutely <laughs> it's much more authentic. Yeah. That flying off. Also, since I couldn't find the uh, right shaft coupler, um, the, um, I'm going to use a smaller uh, auger because this bigger one has a slightly larger um, uh, shaft diameter and doesn't fit well in there. Um, this one actually um, could work quite well. Um, I also invite you to play around with the different um, uh, auger sizes and types uh, because the smaller, one, the smaller ones will move material. Uh, at different speeds, um, and so you'll get different results. Um, I would probably shoot for something at least this big for this build, for the three-quarter inch. Um, you just don't want, I found, you don't want something that uh, is so close to the internal diameter of the barrel uh, that it's like right up against it, because then material will get stuck in between, and it will jam. So you want something that's actually like pretty significantly smaller uh, than the inside of your barrel because it's just going to be like, it's just moving uh, material in that general direction.
funny because I was going to say, for like a foam build, you might want to put some like hot glue in there. And then I realized the reason this isn't fitting is because I put some <laughs> hot glue in there. Nice. Yeah. This is also probably a good time to mention, if you're watching, that like if you're looking at this being like, don't these people know that they can just do this? The answer is either no or yes, but I haven't gotten a chance to try yet. So uh, if you're like, wait, this could be way better, you're totally right. Uh, and I invite you to do whatever you want that you think would make it better. Um, there's a lot of plastic out there and a lot of ways you could do this better. Yeah, this is like an older design that's not holding it as well. I'm trying to think. We have something that looks very much like the final extruder. Okay. So now, the final project or uh, part of this project is to add the heaters and to add the thermistors. Um, the heaters will obviously get it hot and the thermistors will prevent it from getting too hot because uh, if you just let the heaters run uh, without the temperature control of the 3D printer they'll get too hot and they'll start to burn the plastic. Um, and so you really want great, the best like um, Ventilation, proper ventilation when 3D printing generally and trash printing particularly is always a good idea. But the best ventilation is good fume control and the best uh, fume control is good temperature control. Um, and um, so you want your thermistors to be as close to the thing that gets hot and particularly like the part of the thing that gets hot uh, as possible, because if you have your thermistor too far away, then it will be registering a much lower temperature uh, than what the um, uh, heater is actually putting out. Um, so, for this one, you can see this is also a good way to test how far the uh, auger is pushing down to the barrel. So we're just going to take this one. So this is the 25mm uh, by 35mm heater band. And that size fits great, maybe even a little too snug, um, right around the uh, three-quarter inch MPT barrel. So that makes a really good contact. Um, we can slide that down like that. All right. And then 
We'll do the thermistors. Well, we'll do this thermistor last. We'll do this one as we slide it on. The way I've been doing this one is uh, I'm just sort of, um, it doesn't really matter the orientation of these because you can pull them away. But generally, you might as well have it like facing up away from uh, the print side of things. Um, and then you'll just sort of loosely put it on there. And then I've been loosening this. And then getting that into that hole that's created between the hex of the uh, fitting and the uh, heater band. Ideally, this heater band would be making smooth, round contact across this whole thing like the other one is. Um, but the fact that this has a hex head and it's not doing that does make it easy to place the uh, thermistor right in there. So you want the thermistor right in there so that the metal part is making good, clean, direct contact with the metal that's being measured, but not so uh, direct that it is uh, that this, these plastic wires here are in direct contact with the hot metal. So I'll line that one up and then tighten this down. For this one, the uh, temperature control is slightly less important, still very important, um, but I was having good luck just sliding it in right there uh, inside this little clip that holds it in place, like that. All right, so now we have two thermistors. Um, I should also say these um, thermistors are different, um, but um, in the documentation they'll be the same. Uh, they're just the same style, so I use them for demonstration purposes. Um, and then we can just go ahead and screw this barrel back on. Okay, we should be uh, streaming here. So welcome, if you're watching, to uh, the second round of the Trash Printer version 3, what I'm calling the mini version um, build. So um, the Trash Printer is a open source, uh, large format 3D printer that prints directly from recycled plastic trash plates. Um, you can see here, these are shredded uh, polypropylene test tubes. Um, and that's the material uh, that you feed the trash printer so that you don't have to turn recycled plastic into filament. And so the parts that the trash printer can make are large and strong. This is a wind turbine that I 3D printed. Um, and um, they sort of, they make less detailed, parts because the nozzle is quite large. Um, 
Certainly uh, less accurate than a typical 3D printer because you're not making uh, filament. But the parts it makes are um, really strong and um, very, like, definitely uh, useful. And so since you're starting with trash, the bar is extremely low. Um, and anything useful that you can make out of that trash is an improvement. Um, and so it's a really fun thing to hack with. I've been working on this project for since 2016, so <laughs> six years. Um, and um, it all started when I built the precious plastic uh, open source um, 3D or shredder, plastic shredder that uh, first let me shred up waste plastic into that uh, those flakes. Um, but then I started thinking about like what can I make out of those flakes? And um, the precious plastic website, preciousplastic.com. It's an open source global movement of people trying to make small scale, like community scale, uh, plastic recycling infrastructure. It's really, really, really cool. Definitely check it out. Um, but um, they started with four machines. They had the shredder, an injection molder, a uh, compression oven, and an extruder. So I built the extruder and um, started thinking like, man, it would be so cool if we could strap this to a robot and uh, just have it, you know, print like a 3D print head. And so I started trying to figure out how to do that. And I've gone through, at this point, three iterations. I started off with the mostly printable CNC gantry, uh, which is designed by V1 Engineering. And then I moved to the Lowrider 2 gantry, also designed by V1 Engineering. That's over here. Um, if you're looking for a good CNC, I really like uh, the MPCNC. Um, and uh, their documentation is at this point way better than mine. So definitely go check it out if you're interested. But I started trying to figure out how I could make an enclosure for it um, and so and kind of make it a more portable, easy to move around uh, thing. And so I started um, seeing if I could build one out of a service cart um, that you can get at Harbor Freight. You can also get them online. Uh, this is one of them. Um, and I started over here. This is the original version three trash printer. Um, and that's like the regular size, which is roughly 24 inches by 36 inches. Um, and uh, those surface carts, though, also come in a smaller version, which is uh, 30 inches by 16 inches. And um, I'm uh, living in a shuttle bus, a converted shuttle bus called the Magic Tool Bus. And uh, space is kind of at a premium in there. And I want to be able to travel around and um, teach people how to trash print. So I'm building this mini version out of the um, smaller cart. And uh, I've never built one of these before. Um, I've actually never built a whole trash printer like this from scratch on camera so that uh, people can really see what I'm doing and hopefully be able to replicate it. Because in my opinion, um, I'm psyched that I'm able to recycle my trash. Uh, that wind turbine that I showed you was just my takeout containers and uh, disposable coffee cups uh, that I collected over the winter. Um, so you can actually just make stuff out of your real actual trash. Um, and, um, but it's really only cool or useful if a lot of people can also do it. And it's also still very experimental. There are some particular challenges to uh, 3D printing with recycled plastic. The common plastics, the most common plastics that are recyclable are uh, called the olefins, the class of plastics, um, and that's polypropylene and polyethylene. I've been mostly printing with polypropylene, which is number five. Um, and, uh, but together, polypropylene and uh, HDPE or polyethylene generally, uh, which also includes LDPE number four, um, make up over 50% of all household waste plastic. So it's a huge waste stream. Uh, that's just underutilized, in my opinion. Um, and uh, But those plastics have like a little bit of uh, challenges. They've got a very high thermal warp, and so they expand and contract a lot. And um, it makes it really difficult to do high detail um, parts like you would imagine when you think of a 3D printed part or a typical small desktop 3D printer. And so these parts, the, the trash printer just has a really big nozzle. And you can kind of select the, the size that you want. And I've been playing around with all sorts of different sizes. I find that I get not very good results below about two or three millimeters for the um, nozzle. Um, 
But when you do that, you get really, really strong thick-walled parts. And the parts that it makes are more comparable to injection molding uh, than they are to typical 3D parts, which is interesting because parts like the service cart that are injection molded often require a several hundred ton pounds of force injection molding machine. And most of those are in China, which means that anything that's made that way has to be shipped to America, typically across the Pacific Ocean. And that obviously um, has a huge energy cost that is enormous, but also very hard to quantify. And uh, in my experiments with the uh, trash printer, I found that roughly the ballpark for recycling, including shredding and then 3D printing, is roughly uh, one watt hour per gram. Um, there's probably a pretty good amount of variation in there depending on what you're printing and all that, but that's the ballpark, which works out very nicely to one kilowatt hour per kilogram. Um, and um, this um, wind turbine is roughly, uh, let's say, in the ballpark of 500 grams. And a typical modern three to 400 watt solar panel on average will produce one kilowatt hour of electricity uh, over the course of a year, or uh, per day, um, averaged over the course of a year. So like two in July and one in December, roughly, or half in December, and also it depends on where you are. But that's like, as a rule of thumb, one kilowatt hour on average per day per modern solar panel, uh, which means that one trash printer and a shredder can recycle roughly uh, one kilogram of plastic per day running on nothing but sunshine and trash, which is pretty neat. I'm sure those numbers could stand to be dramatically improved, uh, and that's where you come in. Um, so I want to make this design as easy to build as possible, and so I'm going to try and build it in front of you. Um, I've never um, built one of these. Uh, <laughs> I've never built one of these uh, all at once, uh, nor have I ever built the small one. So we'll see how it goes, and I'll probably have to solve some problems as we go. Uh, but hopefully this will create a usable record uh, that you can use to build your own uh, with your friends if you want to. Um, something that's cool, I think, about this is that it uses these service carts, and these service carts come with these two decks. And so the decks, when put like this, act as like a rugged carrying case. You can sort of carry it like a suitcase. Uh, you could also probably put rollers on it. You could ship it. It's kind of its own box. And then you open it up, and then, oh, let's see if that camera focuses, okay. So this is everything that you need to build a trash printer, um, except for the electronics, which are over here. These are the electronics. And so you can see these would definitely fit in there. I just haven't figured out how to do it and they're sensitive, so I don't wanna like put them in there, but all of the parts for the trash printer can fit inside itself, uh, which is pretty neat. And uh, it makes it really portable, easy to ship. Um, people have asked me if I could make kits and I would love to be able to. Uh, I just have not gotten to that point because this is the first time I've ever done that uh, or done this. So uh, bear with me here. I'm gonna sort of unpack the things and then we're gonna get started. Um, So these are power electronic cords, entry cables. I'm gonna put these over here. All right, I'm gonna put the wheels. These are nice uh, rolling casters that I got. Uh, I think they were about 40 bucks, I don't actually remember. Um, but they lock and they all lock and they all swivel which uh, makes it really easy to move a thing around. If you've ever been to an Ikea, uh, you know that you have those drift carts. So that's what you get when you get four-way swivel. But you can also just use the stock casters that come with the cart. Um, these are bonus, but I think they're worth it because they make it extra maneuverable, at least in my situation. For this build, I've already assembled the extruder. Um, and so I'm gonna link uh, to the video that shows you how to build this 
um, but you can see it's pretty straightforward and it's it's made almost entirely almost entirely out of uh, hardware store parts so these are all things that you can buy at a hardware store they're very common this is actually like a flare fitting um, and this is actually one of the, the larger nozzles that I've tried. Um, so every time I build one, I try and try something different. And I've never had anything that I've put together uh, not work. Um, I've just had some that work better than others or have sort of more interesting results. And I'm kind of more, originally when I started building, I was really interested in seeing how high I could get the resolution. Like, could I make it look like a real, real 3D printer? Uh, like with a really high um, resolution. And I just found that I think that it's, I'm more intrigued now by these big, large parts that are very strong and can be printed uh, relatively, actually surprisingly fast uh, compared to a typical 3D printer. A typical 3D printer, just like a full bed of bar parts, can easily take a couple days if they're big uh, and highly detailed. And so um, the trash printer printed that wind turbine, and I was going pretty slow, I think in about five hours. Um, and I printed cups and vases and turbines that are a little bit smaller than that, going a little bit faster in an hour or two. Um, so it is, uh, it can make larger things a lot faster than a typical 3D printer can. Um, so I'm gonna put this over here. All right. And then in order to sort of hold everything together and put everything, you know, uh, the custom parts that turn the service cart into uh, a printer and not just a cart, um, are just these wooden laser cut parts. Um, and they're very simple. Um, and uh, they can be cut way faster than uh, 3D printed parts. Um, if you have access to a laser cutter, they're also 2D files, so you can CNC route them if you have a CNC router. You can also 3D print them. I have them in my documentation as STLs. If you only have a 3D printer and don't have access to a laser cutter, you can 3D print them. They just uh, will take some more time. Um, I've not 3D printed them myself, so if you do try that, please let me know and let me know how it goes. Uh, I'd love to know what that looks like. Um, and, uh, but if you do have a laser cutter, if you have a friend who has a laser cutter, if you've got a makerspace that you can go to, you can cut these out uh, out of lots of different materials. This is a quarter inch plywood, craft plywood from the hardware store. And all of these parts I cut out of three, I think 24 by 12 inch uh, sheets. And if I hadn't done some tests and like had sort of oriented them a little bit differently, I think I could have done it in two. So that's about 20 bucks worth of material. Um, you can also make them out of uh, clear acrylic. I'm looking forward to doing that sometime because I think it would look really cool and probably be a little bit lighter. Um, so if you're feeling like it and you do actually build one, also feel free to experiment with um, materials. The design is um, none of the uh, parts should be affected by thickness. I think you can, there's some variation there at least. Um, you obviously want it to be strong. Uh, so I designed it for exactly quarter inch material, but if your material is slightly thicker or slightly thinner than that, uh, it should still work. Just be aware that I know that quarter inch works. So put these aside. Just got some hardware. Um, this project is an entry. Um, we made it through the first round, so it will be one of the projects considered for the 2022 Hackaday Prize uh, at the end of October. And um, and so um, 
you can check out the Hackaday documentation. That will have the best, most up-to-date uh, version of the documentation, detailed parts list, exact quantities. Um, but generally, it uses um, 5 eighths or 5 sixteenths uh, hardware, mostly. Um, I'm going to check that out. I think that's an inch and a quarter. Um, and um, then it also uses skateboard bearings, some metric hardware, mostly for the steppers, uh, and then some uh, smaller um, screws to hold the, uh, or bolts, I should say, to hold the rollers together. Um, but all of these parts are uh, readily available, if not at a local hardware store, then on Amazon. You can get them anywhere from Amazon. I highly support that. Uh, a lot of the plumbing fittings and stuff uh, and the wood augers and stuff I've been able to find at places like Restore or Rebuilding Center in Portland. Um, and so if you can get those things used, uh, definitely do that. You know, it's very satisfying to build a trash printer out of trash. Um, I also mentioned yesterday that um, some of these parts, uh, it seems, can be trash printed. Um, the bottom assembly for the extruder, which is already in the extruder, so I can't show you, um, but uh, I was using laser cut wooden discs that were sort of stacked to make a funnel that uh, holds the bottom part of the extruder together. And then I just exported that 3D model as a STL and I uh, trash printed it out of, you know, takeout containers. And it is now in service in the new model of the uh, trash printer. So we're a long way from being able to have a self replicating printer entirely, but you can print at least some of the parts for the trash printer with a trash printer. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, these are um, the uh, shaft couplers that connect the motors to these lead screws. These There are four 5 16 by 2 foot, 24 inch um, threaded rods and coupling nuts. And these will hold the whole printer together. So we'll get to that. And then these are the lead screws that move uh, all of the axes around. Um, you can use threaded rod, but I recommend that you don't. Um, the pitch of these, which is the amount that it moves uh, per rotation, is a lot higher and it's just a lot smoother. They're designed for it. But if you only have access to hardware parts and you can get threaded rod and you can't get anything else, you can make a trash printer with those. It just doesn't work as well. It makes the motors work harder and slower. Okay, so I'm going to move these out of the way. This build doesn't take a lot of heavy power tools, uh, but it does take some. Um, not really heavy power tools, but power tools. You only have to cut and drill a couple of places. Um, but basically what we're going to do, this is the top part. The other part um, that I put over here is the um, bottom part. And so most of the modifications you have to make are to this top deck. What we're going to do is we're going to cut out the bed from here. Um, and I mentioned this uh, the other day, but it's cool, so I'll mention it again. The, um, these service carts are made out of polypropylene because polypropylene is a very useful, versatile plastic. And so what that means uh, is that we're going to save all of the shavings and cuttings and uh, bits that come off from us modifying this cart. And then uh, once the trash printer is up and running, we can feed them to it and uh, recycle those things into new stuff, which, <laughs> which I think is uh, really neat and very satisfying. So let me flip this over. Um, you'll notice that the service carts are basically identical they use almost an identical injection mold. Really the only difference between them 
is on this one, it has these indentations for where the legs will go and the uh, top part doesn't. So that's how you know which one's which. So, and then part of the reason that I use these because they're identical and because these, um, I know that if you get these from Harbor Freight, which are available at least in every major city in America, um, and also available online and are very common, they use, if not identical, they use very similar injection molds, which means the locations of all these points are almost always the same. I've not tried using it with a, a cart that is not from Harbor Freight. So uh, if you try and buy one on Amazon, maybe double check, you may have to either drill new holes or modify the uh, design files so that the holes match up. But I did that so that the holes will match up. So basically the uh, Z axis motors are held in place by these little triangles and they're designed so that they line up with these holes. Um, and we'll see if that actually is the case. I can see that because of this rail, this doesn't line up like it's off by maybe two millimeters. Um, but uh, we'll see what it's like on the inside because uh, it's not going to go on this side. It's going to go on the other side. So all of the parts that are currently available um, on the Hackaday page are the parts um, that I've got here uh, as they're you know, designed in there. After this build, depending on how it goes, um, lost focus on the camera. Hey, I'm down here. There we go. Okay. So, um, this is going to go like that. It's going to go like that. This is going to go like that. And the, they're the same parts, so they're reversible. They would probably look a little bit nicer if you made them out of uh, acrylic or something. Um, these ones got a little toasty because of the laser. Um, so, we're going to go through. On these ones, the holes go all the way through on the bottom, but on the top, they don't, uh, which makes it so the top of the service cart is watertight. Um, and uh, But when we're done with it, it certainly won't be. So we're going to get in here. I'm just going to drill out uh, a couple of these holes, and we're going to see if everything lines up or if I have to move some of the holes. Um, hopefully, by the time that you watch this, uh, I will have already modified the parts to reflect any changes that I have to make to do this so that you don't have to do those. Um, the, the sort of goal or one of the challenges uh, about this project that I find really interesting is how do you lower the bar barrier to entry so that it's as easy as possible for people to build this with as few specialized tools or skills as possible using readily available parts. Um, it's also like um, that sort of dovetails with uh, an invitation to please uh, participate with this if you're interested. Um, you may be looking at this, particularly if you know anything about 3D printing. This is the first 3D printer that I ever built. Um, and uh, you might be thinking to yourself, <laughs> Doesn't that person know that they could just do it this way, that it would be easier or better if it was like this? And the answer is I either don't or haven't had time to try. So if you do, uh, you've got ideas, totally go for it. Uh, this is all open source. It's, um, it's designed to be easy for you to participate with, and you have my full consent uh, and enthusiastic support to, to just run with it. It would be cool if you like mention me or let me know when you do that because I love hearing uh, you know that this work is sort of doing anything in the world. Uh, but you don't have to, so please don't like ask if I if you can do this. Just do it and uh, let me know how it goes. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna make some loud noises and we'll start with this one just to see how it lines up. So we're going to 
end up with a lot of stuff that looks kind of like that. And we'll save it, shut it up, and feed it to the trash printer when we're done. I'm going to put this over here for now. All right. <laughs> God, I love when that happens. All right, so uh, can you see that? Yeah, it totally lines up, at least close enough. Uh, I could dial in that hole a little bit, uh, but that's definitely close enough to work. So that's really exciting. Great, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and drill the rest of that. And then when we cut out the cart, we'll do it about an inch and a half from the side here. And so these three will stay on the top part of the gantry. And then this one um, will uh, be part of the bed. And that's where we're going to put the Z axis. That's why this lines up with this. Um, and so doing it that way just means that you don't have to measure. It's already measured for you. You can just go off uh, how this is already designed as a guide because, you know, when you're using laser cut parts, you know, a couple of millimeters off can make a big difference. So it's nice to just not have to measure. It also saves just some time. So, but I'm going to drill those ones out anyway because they will eventually be uh, where the lead screws go. Well, the lead, what are those called? Nuts. All right. You wanted to have this as straight as possible, and you could use a drill press, but I'm definitely not gonna, and I think it's fine. It's uh, sometimes a good idea to do this over a piece of like painter's plastic or something, so that you can just sort of like pull up the plastic and condense all of the shavings. I'm just going to sweep it up when we're done. I apologize for the loud noises. that. Now one of the neat things about the uh, trash printer, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little bit of hair in there, is that because you're using such uh, so much larger of a nozzle than a typical 3D printer, 
it's just very tolerant of very dirty material. You can have dust, you can have bits of labels, bits of food, bits of sand, and it'll just print right in there. Um, and so you don't, you can clean the uh, plastic and you can start from particularly clean waste streams, a lot of like not post-consumer, but like industrial um, waste products, which is how I got those shredded up test tubes, um, are uh, very clean and um, don't need, you know, post-processing that way. If you have a dirty feedstock, it's fine. It might look a little ugly, um, but, uh, but it will print just fine and it won't stop it from printing, which is really nice. Um, so I've been on a sort of journey to sort of a race to the bottom to figure out what's the like lowest quality uh, actual dirty real world trash that I can use. What's the minimum processing that I can do uh, to turn this back into something useful. Uh, and I've been surprised uh, that it's like quite doable, um, but it's also a ongoing uh, experiment. So. Um, I think I might have missed a hole there. I'm going to check. Okay. Oh, I got that one. Okay. Just going to flip this back over. All right. And now you can see we've got our holes. <clears throat> so, let's see how we did here. So this one lines up, I think in the future, I'll probably take uh, a little bit off this, um, but I do think it is going to work. Uh, although mm, I might need to go uh, cut those um, just on a saw or something, which I always uh, try to avoid doing, but it is sometimes unavoidable, especially the first time you do something. So I'm just gonna sort of test this out. Well, that's pretty good. All right, so yeah, that could come in. <laughs> it's really only here, so I'm going to make a note of that. is the sensor are all the same. I can just do that sort of in one fell swoop. If I go put them on my saw, Oops. okay, I'm going to go do that. So bear with me. Uh, enjoy the uh, view while I go do that, uh, and I'll be right back. All right, well, that was just an ideal, but relatively straightforward. Hopefully it worked. Really, it's the whole location uh, rather than the shape of this outside thing, I think. So let's see how that lines up now. 
that lines up a lot better. Really, it's this. Uh, this should be kind of at a different sort of softer angle. Um, I don't think it'll matter, but for future testing, I'm just going to go do this. I apologize that this is not a more uh, put together compelling live stream, but you get what you get. All right. Oh yeah, because you can see, um, hopefully here, let me line this up a little bit more. There's this hole, which I don't know if you can see that well, but if you have these a little bit shorter, it means that you can sort of dial in so that is perfectly aligned. And that's really good uh, because the more uh, well aligned this is, the better your lead screws are gonna work. So. Got to adjust that, but I put this all together with a uh, model of one of these carts uh, that someone posted on the 3D Warehouse. Um, whoever did that, thank you very much. I owe you a debt of gratitude because this would have been very difficult to model. And um, they did it accurate down to, I mean, a couple of millimeters. Um, and uh, But I based my um, measurements on that. So uh, you always need to test. Um, your digital models against the real world, but once you get them to line up, uh, it can be really magical. Also, um, I should say that if you are uh, familiar with SketchUp, if you have SketchUp or SketchUp Pro, um, you can, or if you don't, you can use the web viewer. You can also use the uh, SketchUp app, but the design for this printer, I designed this printer with SketchUp. So the SketchUp model, this is sort of a reflection in reality of the SketchUp model and not the other way around. And so it is extremely accurate. It's still a work in progress. Obviously, you can tell that some of the, uh, you know, details still need to be adjusted. But it's on there. If you search for uh, Trash Printer version 3, you'll find it. You can download it. You can see all of the parts, including the cart. In fact, it also includes uh, like a mock-up of the parts that you need to build the shredder as well. So if that's something that you have access to and feel comfortable doing, you can use that as a reference. I find it really handy to sort of check against a digital model. Um, and so uh, know that you have that in your uh, toolkit as well. So let's make sure they all fit just so there are no surprises. Oh, those look really good. OK. Pretty happy with that. All right, and then, so these are the parts that are gonna go, and um, I always forget which axis is which, uh, this ways. Um, and um, they're gonna go here. This thing doesn't actually, this indentation here, it's just for measuring, really. It, um, it doesn't matter, but it sort of like pushes that against and into place. And then we're gonna go through measure where these holes are, these holes, uh, and then we're going to put bolts through and that'll hold the thing together. Um, so um, one note is that uh, by the time you watch this, if you're watching it, you know, a couple weeks from now, uh, these little tabs will probably be removed from the design. Uh, these are kind of vestigial. These were for uh, belts, but I've moved away from belts for lead screws. I think they're better in basically every way. 
uh, and they're not really more expensive and they're easier to design around and build more accurate anyway. So um, that's why those are there and they're designed to sort of hang out, you know, to the side there, but um, you don't really need them. So if you want to remove them in your models, if you feel comfortable doing that, feel free to do that. That's also true of the uh, other parts. For example, these holes here and these holes here. This was originally for rollers and then this was for a belt stepper. You can leave them in if you want. It does, I think, work with belts, although I never tried it. So um, I'll probably have a belt version and a non-belt version, but removing this will probably cut down on your laser time. So just know that. All right. So the next thing, big thing we have to do, and this is like the most major modification uh, that we're gonna have to do, is to make this cut. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna start by making it, uh, make sure everything's ready. Okay. I've got this like uh, multi-tool here that has like uh, different heads for it. So this is both a uh, power drill and a, um, jigsaw. Um, so uh, both of those tools are useful. Um, but it doesn't really matter what tool you make you use to make the cut, but it does matter the distance uh, because you want to have a lip here that these parts can securely sit against. And you want to make sure that you only get this part and not uh, interfere with any of these holes. So that uh, distance, I mean, I picked it randomly because it was what the distance of this tool was, uh, but it also happens to work great. So most um, jigsaws, uh, at least the sort of Ryobi ones, it seems, um, have an offset of about uh, one and a half inches. So just either draw a line and use whatever tool you want, or use a tool like this that already has the offset, and that helps you make nice, clean, smooth cuts. So I'm just sort of gonna like run this along here that just sort of makes a slight mark. That looks really good to me. So originally I had sort of made a hole here and here. That's what I did for this one and it works fine. But uh, in retrospect, I kind of wish I had made just a drill the hole that was just built big enough uh, there and then put the blade in and went this way and then that way so I can get right into the corners. Um, so I'm going to do that. I don't know if this bit that I have is big enough. I think it is actually. Okay. So we're going to do that. I'm going to do that on this side here so I can have a marking. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing here. Okay. All right. Thankfully, this doesn't have to be particularly accurate. Um, also, kind of conveniently, you can find a place you can sort of see the indentations on here. Um, it'll be easier to see when you're actually building it, but there are these diamond shape diagonal uh, indentations that are indicative of where these are. And so you'll have an easier time if you start in a place where you know that it's thin, um, which ha just happens to be right in the middle, which is handy. So it's right there, right there, right there, and right there. So we'll start by doing those. So while I'm here, I'm going to just make sure that I can actually do this. Ooh, nice. Great. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
And now we're going to make our cuts. It's going to be loud again. good idea when you do this to give the blade a second to cool down because um, uh, it will get hot and hot enough to make the plastic kind of soft and or melt it so um, just be aware of that it gets a little you can see um, can you see you can't see It gets a little like uh, melty um, and uh, that's fine. Uh, you just like want to make sure that the blade doesn't get too hot. So it's good to take breaks. Speaking of which. The good news is this is the most involved part of the build. This is like the most modification that you have to do. Other than this, it's just drilling a couple holes. So it's possible for anyone to watch this. I'm going to turn. I'm not going to talk because I turned my mic down. You're welcome. So let's see here. Check. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yeah. I, uh, I took this opportunity to go get some different saw blades because um, I want to see which ones work better. So I've got like a smaller wood one that's got a little bit more bite. I've got one, I believe this is for, uh, this is a special one, this is for acrylic. So the uh, l the bite is a little bit thinner. I think that's gonna be too fine for this. Um, and then I've got these like big chunky ones um, that are for cutting wood fast. And I think these might work because the plastic is pretty soft. So I'm gonna give one of these a shot uh, because if it's better, it will probably make this easier for everyone. If only because it makes it that it has to be loud for not as much time. Um, you have to put the blade in the right way. 
Turns out. Okay. So, and the nice thing is these lines don't need to be uh, particularly straight. Uh, this acts as a really nice guide, but it does curve ever so slightly. But since this is going to match up perfectly with this, any imperfections in this line are going to match with this one, and it will be fine. It will also mostly be about an inch below, depending on how long your uh, barrel is. Um, so I'm going to put these aside, and I'm going to give this one a shot. Whenever I cut, I'm going to turn down my mic uh, as a courtesy. So uh, I'll see you in a sec. So this line is a lot cleaner. Ah. This line with the uh, fast wood uh, blade is a lot cleaner and cuts a lot faster. So that's good. I'm going to go with this one. So I'm going to pull this in here so you can see what I'm doing.
Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, I've run out of battery on both of my uh, power tools. So I'm gonna go put one of these on the charger and uh, we'll do some other stuff in the meantime. And uh, always remember to keep your batteries charged, I suppose. <laughs> Okay, so um, while that's charging, I'm going to clean up a little bit and I'm going to um, do some other stuff after that. Um, we'll do a sort of more um, thorough cleanup once all of this is done, but this is by far the messiest part. Polypropylene uh, is known to be uh, very statically active. I believe it's positively charged or gets positively charged. Um, and so you'll notice that sometimes when it falls, it like behaves in kind of funny ways. Sometimes they'll fly all over the place, especially the small bits. So keep that in mind. Obviously, it's best to keep uh, plastic as contained as possible. I'll uh, pull up this um, sheet when we're done and make sure I get all of it off uh, with a vacuum. Um, I'm going to go grab a container uh, to contain this plastic because I am starting to build up quite a bit of it. Check, check. Check one. Check two. Okay, we're back. All right. So, I went to grab a uh, container. And it just turns out that the easiest thing I had was this, which just so happens to be number five polypropylene. So you can see like any plastic that has this sort of translucent, milky uh, look to it is usually uh, polypropylene. Polypropylene is used in a lot of food safe containers. Uh, it's not always this translucent, but this is sort of its like natural undyed state. Um,
And this is kind of interesting. So I don't know if you can see this, but it kind of, you can see how it sort of like flies out of there. Uh, that's because of the uh, static electricity, static charge. So it's good to have a uh, container that is taller than this. Uh, so it can kind of contain that. It really only happens with the um, smaller particles and it happens when you brush along the thing, kind of like when you rub your hair uh, with static electricity with a, like a balloon, um, it, uh, it charges it up. So just be aware of that. Um, it also, like generally you want your um, shredded material to be sort of a quarter inch, uh, like granules if you can. Uh, rather than these like small shavings, but you can mix these small shavings in with other shred and that will uh, make it print a lot better. So you can print directly from this stuff, uh, but I would recommend mixing it in with some higher quality shred like the test tubes that I um, showed earlier. All right, I'm gonna see if I got enough charge just then to finish these two small cuts. Here we go.
check, check. Okay, you can hear me? All right, so um, that's the hardest part in terms of uh, sort of construction, power tools, uh, whatever. Um, I do kind of wish that I had uh, contained the plastic a little bit better. Uh, it's good to have, and uh, if you're going to be building a trash printer, you should have one anyway. It's good to have a um, shop vac uh, that is sort of dedicated just to plastic, so you're not using it for like dust or anything. You just use it for collecting up the plastic that uh, you know falls around, and um, and then just making sure it has a good filter on it and all that. And then you can just take that. It's like a, um, I've also had good luck putting a cyclone filter in line, a cyclonic filter and the plastic just drops out of the um, air. In fact, I'll show you. This is my uh, plastic collector uh, that I used over the winter. And so I made this um, bin, and I've got about something like five kilograms of uh, shredded recycled plastic in here. This is like my actual trash. Um, and so um, what I did is I connected this part, the uh, suction, to or no, um, this part to the uh, suction of a shop pack and then this part to a hose, and then use that to suck up the plastic. The plastic comes in here, and because it's heavier than air, it gets spun around and falls out into the container. So it's a good way to collect plastic and keep your uh, filters in your shop back from getting clogged. So if you're wondering, yes, I am concerned about microplastics. Um, I wish I had sort of uh, been a little bit more careful. Um, I'm going to do a deep clean and uh, collect as many of these as, you, as I can. But when you're doing this, um, I would recommend having a friend or um, having a uh, shop vac attachment for your uh, saw. So you can just like um, collect up these shavings as they're being made. Uh, and that'll just cut down on the overall waste. I do feel like um, if you have a trash printer and you use it, you will be cutting down on plastic waste because you're taking plastic that otherwise, you know, may be recycled. Uh, and there's like nothing wrong with um, city or like larger scale recycling if it's actually happening. But what happens often um, is that plastic is not getting properly recycled. Um, and um, so it does end up in landfills and sometimes in the ocean. Um, and so learning how to um, do this better and better, uh, I think, is important and is worth um, generating a little bit of waste. And also, with that said, that's no excuse for not being careful. So I feel like I was not as careful as I could have been um, with this and uh, let that be a cautionary tale. But it is important, and it's a problem that we're all dealing with. Um, and anything that you can do to do it better and better um, helps.
Man, there are days and there are days. So one of the things you're going to want to do is make sure that you have a sturdy work table when you build the trash printer. It's always funny when you're live streaming because I have no idea if anyone saw that. So I hope you did. I hope so. <laughs> I hope someone besides me saw that. Oh, well, on Facebook, somebody did. Um, hello, whoever's watching. Who is that? No, oh, it doesn't tell me. Well, leave a comment. Let me know you saw it. Let this be a lesson to everyone, but mostly me, to not do it that way next time. Also use a table that like isn't already broken, that helps. And that's how you make a trash printer. So, I'm going to pull this in. And this will be my work field ball. I'm going to get the focus right. Cool. 
All right. Well, now we have our top deck, and we've got our Z bed. Not sure why the camera isn't focusing. Um, we, hopefully it'll come back in a sec. I had to set the focus manually, but that seems to have worked. Um, thanks for bearing with me, <laughs> if you are bearing with me, because uh, this is my uh, first stream, and I'm still kind of getting the hang of it. Um, all right. So, now that we have this mostly set up, we're going to take the base, we're going to start installing the caster wheels. Um, and this is going to basically, um, the rest of the bolts are going to connect as normal, but one of them is going to connect backwards. Um, and so it's going to connect to the threaded rods and that's going to hold the whole cart together in like a more secure way than just like the screws that it comes with. So it makes it more rigid. Um, so we'll line these up. All right. And I'm going to get this hardware from over here. Hold the wheel on like normal. They're going to go in from the top. And, hmm. Okay, there it goes. <laughs> um, they're going to go in from the top and bolt on the bottom. This one is going to go in from the bottom and bolt from the top. And this one we're going to leave uh, open because we're going to use that hole as a place for the lead screw to rest. Um, so I used only three bolts on the other one. I actually only used two. Don't tell anyone. Um, 
and it's fine. Um, so let's see if I can get these in. I'm going to start from the other side. Probably it makes sense to start with this inner corner here. Do that. Oh, and when you do this at the same time, you also have to put on the legs. And if you have a new cart, mine on the old one, uh, I was using just like I, I left it out and it just sort of, I think, got a little warped. But when you have a new cart, these should fit in right there just, just perfectly. Um, and you'll notice they have square uh, holes and the, square, the holes are square so that they can fit the square of the carriage bolts. Um, so let's start in this corner, put that down there, and then And then place this. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'll make it easier to do the next one. And then if you can see this, you'll connect this one and this one, and that should be enough to hold the wheel in place. Um, and then you'll leave uh, these two open because they're kind of, we're doing something special with them. So let me grab my driver, see if it fits. All right, it doesn't, so I'm going to use my wrench. You want to make sure that you don't have any like dust or anything. Small bits of plastic are fine, but you want to make it so it makes clean contact on there because then that'll just make it so that it's flat and that all the angles are right and it'll just be better if you do. So. <sighs> Now, because I did the last one, I think you get the idea of how the casters attach. I'm not going to flip this over. I'm going to see if I can do it in the bottom, from the bottom. Flipping it, I think maybe is the best move because otherwise they fall out. 
Eita!
Okay. And then we're going to take a break in just a second. And by we, I mean I. Um, but um, the last thing I want to do, we're going to put those. Um, so these coupling nuts will fit, should fit this hardware that comes with them because it's 5 8 feels a little tight. These ones might be metric, um, in which case you might want to just use one of the bolts uh, that you got. Um, let's see if we can get it with this. Mm -hmm. All right. So that one's too short, and that's the most common one for the build. Um, so I'm going to go find a uh, longer one, which I have, and I'll add that to the parts list. All right, so I had these from previous build. These are 5 16 by 2 inches. Um, I've got a ruler on my arm if you haven't noticed. Um, and uh, let's see, so this one is going to go um, in here in this third outer bolt position and it's going to go up. And you're going to take one of these coupling nuts and I'm going to screw it in from the bottom and then I'll flip it over and show you what it looks like. So, this is a little unstable, it doesn't really fit. Uh, let's see, can you see that? No. All right. So, this one is going to fit right here on this third uh, bolt. And uh, the threaded rod is going to come up here. And that's going to connect the bottom deck to the top deck and keep the whole thing secure. Uh, and then the lead screw is just going to move freely in this hole. Uh, on the other one, I had to drill it out a little bit. On this one, we'll see. Probably have to drill it out at least so it's not square. Um, but it's like, uh, it just like, the lead screw just sits in there and it keeps it secure. So we're going to leave this one open for later. So I'm going to do that for all the other ones. And then I'm going to take a break. Have some lunch.
leave this, put this aside. So that's a good place to leave it. Um, I'm going to move this over here. Uh, and so then these threaded rods will come in here. And should hold the bottom to the top. Um, maybe I'll try and do that as just one final thing. And with that camera, you can't see it because the picture's too small, but it's also kind of its own thing now. So I'm gonna take it off. I guess you can see it on the big camera. Okay. Move this back. Unlock these. Tokyo Drift trash printer cart. Sweet. So when we come back, we can build around this platform and we can start building the gantry around these parts. got a trash printer. Uh, all right, I'll be back. Um, if you're into this documentation, if anyone is watching at all, which would be cool, but I don't really expect it. Uh, if you're watching, you can follow this channel and you'll get updates whenever I stream. I'm going to keep trying to do more and more uh, streams like this uh, to sort of live build things because I think it's a really sometimes embarrassing but extremely effective way to build good documentation because it's really not possible for me to skip steps. Um, everything that goes wrong or every problem that I have to solve is recorded. Um, and so it's a little tedious uh, to perhaps watch, but it makes a really good record of how you actually build something. Um, and if you're into this, if you want to help me stream better, if you want to support this project, uh, you can check out my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash disruptively useful. Um, and uh, if you support for any amount of money, uh, you can join the private Discord that I have for all of my okay, patrons. Of I'm working patrons. on getting it so that. I'm working on getting nope. it so that. Nope. Well, uh, it <laughs> looks like I lost that camera. Looks like I lost. Uh, I'm working on getting it so uh, that it will. Uh, it so there it goes. <laughs> so that I can be con uh, in conversation 
uh, in one of the chat channels with my uh, backers. Uh, so that people who want to be more in depth and ask me questions while I'm doing a live stream build have access to that. Other than that, um, patrons don't get any special perks because all of my um, documentation is open source. The product of this work is open and freely available to the public. All of my updates and uh, progress are documented there. But you do follow me, you get those monthly updates, they'll come to your email and uh, you'll get to see where the project is at. And whenever I have a stable release of something, which is more than just the trash printer, but you'll have to go check out my Patreon and find out exactly how much more. Um, anytime I make progress or make a stable release, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. And so you'll be in the loop as these things develop. Um, so if you're watching, thank you for watching. Uh, follow and you'll be able to find me when I start streaming again. Now, give me a second. I actually turn all of these things off. back to day three of the trash printer version three mini build. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started where I left off yesterday. Uh, yesterday we built the uh, gantry or the assembled the cart. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to take this top part which will become the print bed um, that we cut out the other day. And we're going to widen these holes so that they will fit the lead nuts for the Z axis so the bag can go up and down. Uh, and if you do it just right, you can get it a press fit in there. Um, this is slightly different than the way that I did it when I uh, originally built the first version of the version three. So this will be a little bit of an experiment, but we'll just give it a shot. Okay, so we're going to widen these holes so that they fit this outer uh, bit of the um, lead screw or lead nut. Um, and that's about 10 millimeters. I've got this drill bit. I don't actually know what the diameter is on it. Let's see what it says. 3 eighths. So yeah, 3 eighths is roughly 10 millimeters. It's just a hair. Uh, smaller than 10 millimeters. Um, so we're going to get in there and we're going to sort of uh, widen it uh, until this press, press fits in there. Keep saving our plastic shavings so that we can feed it through to the completed trash printer later. All right, I'll get in there. Not quite. So, I don't know. I like the hardware store that is easy for me to get to doesn't have um, 10 millimeter or metric uh, drill bits. Um, so, a 3 8 one will work. You just have to sort of move it around to widen it out. And the plastic is really soft, so it's really easy to sort of just do this until it fits. I just want to go one step at a time so you don't widen it too much.
That's pretty much there, but it doesn't go deep enough. Let's try that. There we go. That feels pretty good. It goes in all the way. Not quite. I'm going to see if one of these step drill bits that I have will do a better job. This bit, next up above 3 eighths is 7 sixteenths, and that is too wide. Let's see what we got here. So the next up on this one, between 3 eighths and 7 sixteenths is 13 30 seconds. So that's probably the good one. And I'm going to go grab a tool that I don't have.
That worked great. Um, and this, these are Nipex, uh, K-N-I-P-E-X, um, adjustable wrenches. They're great. They're one of my favorite tools. Um, they're infinitely adjustable. Um, and they work great as a sort of press clamp. Um, but they're kind of expensive. I would hate to have uh, people need to buy uh, one this big just um, to do that. Um, so I'll probably take a look and see if I can find a 10 millimeter uh, drill bit and just add that to the parts list because uh, that shouldn't be too expensive. But if you're in the market for some large, really awesome uh, adjustable wrenches, I highly recommend those. Um, and so that one's in perfectly. You can see it's right in there. Uh, all right. So then we're going to do that for the rest of them. Let's see. Oh, that works really well. Great. Okay. Cool. Well, if nothing else, a 3 8 standard uh, drill bit uh, with some, you know, winding motions and some force. Probably a hammer would do it too. You just got to be careful to not uh, damage the lead nut in the process. Maybe a rubber mallet. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm drilling this out and then I'm sort of moving it in sort of widening circles. Uh, and so that also gives it a slight taper as it goes further down, uh, which sort of helps it press fit. Not quite enough on that one. Enough on that one.
good? management here. lead screw or <laughs> lead nuts uh, in each of the four corners on what will become the bed. Um, so now we can go over to our cart and I'm going to roll this up and out of the way. Move this over here. And I did test this a little bit. Um, it's almost, you almost don't need to um, drill out these holes in the bottom here at all. Um, but it does, if, it, if there's any resistance at all, uh, especially if it's on one but not the other ones, uh, then it won't really, uh, it won't move freely and it won't uh, move smoothly. So, I'm just going to build those out. Uh, there's a chance that you won't need to. Um, it also, like, currently the lead screws that I'm using, um, I actually ordered 700 millimeter because they're all I could get really quickly. Um, but I just measured them, and they should be 600. So I'll change the documentation to reflect that. Um, but uh, they go down through the hole that's in the metal plate that is on the uh, wheels. Um, and so... If that's even slightly off, sometimes it can catch on that. So I could have done a better job of being sure that it didn't. But I'm just going to... these.
one's great. That one's great. That one's great. That one's great. Okay. So it really doesn't take much. Um, And before I get too far, I'm going to um, just sort of lightly connect these threaded rods and the uh, associated three volts, um, just so I can keep everything together. I might need to adjust those later. There will be a sort of final calibration. Um, but let's see here. It's going to pop through there. That one's too short. Um, just right. I think I only have two of these, but those are also 5 16 2 inch. Um, there and there, just to see what that looks like. this in here I'm going to line it up with those holes I 
And we're going to put the shaft couplers, four shaft couplers, onto these. So I don't know if you can tell in this video, um, but these are all a little jagged because I cut them. Um, but if you just get the right size um, lead screws to begin with, you won't have to do that. Trying to cut down as much as possible on the um, cutting and just general messing with stuff that is required to do this. So I'm going to put all these um, shaft couplers on and I'm going to tighten them down. You can see I'm having like a little bit of a hard time with these uh, because when you cut them, there's some bits that come off. Um, so um, you also shouldn't have to deal with that. Okay, and then we'll feed these through this hole. Uh, doesn't matter what you start with. And we're gonna try and set it in there. It's pretty good. These feel a little tight. Um, may need to widen those holes, or they might just work once I get the motors on there. But we'll find out soon enough.
and we're going to attach the shaft coupler to the motor and we're going to pull up on these lead screws so you can see that pull up to make sure that it's as tight against the motor shaft as you can These motors have a flat part of their shaft and you just want that to line up with at least one of the um, set screws in the uh, shaft coupler just so it makes nice flat contact against there. It's not critical if you don't do that but it sort of ensures that the screw is pushing right up against the flat part of the shaft and so it makes really good contact. And then the other one after that is sort of just a Keep it on there. probably would have had an easier time of this if I had um, done the um, motor, attached the motors to these uh, Z brackets first. Um, but that's why we're doing the live build. So you can see everything that I do wrong and hopefully do as I say, not as I do. And because I didn't do it the easy way, I'm going to have to do it the hard way.
And it turns out these um, M3 bolts that I got to hold the steppers in place are too long. And so they're hitting the um, back. Uh, the, the motor is only threaded so far. Um, and I thought these would be about right, but it turns out they're just a couple of millimeters too long. So I believe these ones are 12 millimeter. Um, so probably 10 millimeter would work. Maybe eight. Luckily I've got an assortment of other ones um, of various lengths. So this, if you can see that, um, I got these are centimeters. That's ten millimeters, um, and we'll see if that's enough. That one works good. So, 10 millimeters or less for those ones. Not today. That looks pretty good. Test how those feel. You can see this is lifting up here because this isn't bolted down here. Those all feel pretty good. Um, so, gonna need to be able to turn those down.
And these motors, I should say, are connected in parallel, parallel, series, series. Um, two of them are connected in series, and then two of those are connected in parallel. Um, and you can see what that looks like sort of here. Uh, but I'll go into that when we do the wiring section. Um, these little four-way snap connectors make it really easy. Um, and um, it performs a lot better when you do that. Um, a lot of control boards, 3D printer control boards, including the Rambo, have a dual output. Uh, so you can have um, dual Z lead screws or steppers. Um, and so what we're doing is just splitting out that dual output into two sets of two so that we can use all four at the same time. Okay. So we got that. Now, I'm going to place these uprights here, and this is mostly just for testing. I want to get a sense of the uh, width between them. I said this yesterday, but I'll say it again. These, um, I, I ended up having to cut these because they weren't quite right uh, for this cart, um, and so I'm going to change the documentation to reflect that. Um, but there are these indentations here, um, and that's more about orienting these uprights side to side uh, than it is um, like uh, like the, it's not strictly speaking necessary. Uh, I also may at some point try and move this over a little bit so that we can get just the slightest bit extra uh, uh, travel since on a smaller cart like this, uh, whatever you can get goes a long way. So, are aluminum rails. Um, I found that they were kind of a loose fit um, for these particular parts. But I'm going to use them to sort of test to know exactly what I should cut the uh, steel rails to. So these just slide on there. <laughs> That's what I mean by being too loose.
Okay. So that is 15 inches and 3 quarters. Um, 15 and 3 quarters inches. Um, and they, there's obviously no penalty uh, for hanging over a little bit. Um, it might not look as nice. Um, but this thing isn't really winning any beauty contest contests anyway. And so uh, if you want to do just straight up 16 inches, uh, that would probably also be fine. is a nominally 16 inch service cart so it would make sense that the um, cross rails on the short side would be 16 inches so I'm just going to do that I can always cut it down by the last little bit if I need to um, just to make it easy sometimes you can either even order or find things pre-cut to standard lengths like that finding a 15 and 3 quarters pre-cut uh, tube, I think, is pretty unlikely. So... And there is some wiggle room here. Um, I mean, these ones are going to be a little bit... They're going to hang over by about an eighth of an inch on either side, at least. Um, and um, that'll probably be uh, mostly onto the motor side, um, since the... Um, uh, otherwise it might stick out too much and block the motor, although, no, I think it's totally clear of it, so that'll be fine. Okay, so then, um, you, oh, you can use, um, I like using these tubing cutters. Um, this is just like a pretty standard tubing cutter. You can get this at most hardware stores. Uh, if you haven't used one of these, I'll show you how to do it. You can also use any other cutting implement you want. Uh, these just make a nice, really clean uh, cut. So, you sort of unscrew it and put it on there. Uh, put it around where you want it, line it up. And it's a, basically, it's not necessarily a razor blade, but it's a very sharp edge. And so, um, you just want to line it up exactly where you want it to be. But it will make a very accurate, clean cut. And then you sort of screw this in until it makes gentle contact. And you can roll it around once. And that'll sort of score it. And then every time you go around, you just tighten. Um, and you just keep doing that until it goes all the way through. Uh, you want to make sure it doesn't... Uh, sometimes it, if you don't have it tight enough, it'll wander. I'll make sure it doesn't wander. Okay. 
This one is also particularly old. Um, and so they, they get dull, as with any tool. Um, so this one's probably going to take a little bit longer than a new one would. But you just roll it around until it uh, cuts through. Oh, you can see. Yep. And sort of get that last little bit. It's interesting. Doing it that way, you get this sort of taper uh, towards the end. And we'll see how that interacts with the press fit action, but I think it's going to work great. So, I'm going to sort of press that in. This is the beauty of laser cut parts. You can get these tolerances good enough, that they just hold in place like that, which is deeply satisfying. And then we'll do that on this side. So a lot of the structure, you can see how floppy these are. But once there's that rail in between, uh, it really is a lot stronger. So. Good. So that, I believe, was just under four feet. I think that was uh, 47 and a half inches previously. So we took um, 16 inches off, and that leaves plenty, just enough, but plenty, uh, to make the other rails. Measure twice. See, uh, based on my uh, previous uh, cut, um, uh, Tighten this down a little tighter the first time so that you don't get that like wandering. If you don't, because when you're first starting it, there isn't a groove for the blade to sit in. So if it's not tight enough, it can just sort of wander. And then you get like a spiral, uh, which is not great, looks messy, and makes it sort of more difficult to cut. So then every couple turns, when the resistance sort of goes away and it gets super easy to move it, just tighten it down maybe uh, just as much as you can to make it tight again. Oh, 
it makes these really clean cuts. And best of all, there are no loud noises. Then you want to adjust them so that they are straight and upright. Um, you don't have to make this perfect, um, but you do want them to be straight because if they're not, uh, the lead screw won't turn as nicely. So those both look pretty good. We will eventually cut or uh, screw in here and, and put bolts in. We're not going to do that yet because it's going to be like the final thing we do. All right. Also, um, it was pretty close on this one, but on the this smaller cart, it appears that the bolt holes that are pre uh, laser cut into this set of files. Um, come out right about here. Here, I'm going to pull this back. Right about here. Um, and there's sort of this like uh, rail uh, of plastic here. That's fine. We can totally drill through it. Uh, it just won't look as nice. So I'm going to make a note to move these bolts kind of over here. Okay. So, starting to look a little bit more like a trash printer. I'm going to move this out of the way. And pull this back. Now, we're going to assemble the rollers, which are going to roll along the rails. And um, they are sort of the uh, linear movement system. Now, of course, there's lots of different ways to get smooth linear motion. Um, and um, they do make, you know, linear bearings and stuff like that. 
Uh, and you can totally order those, uh, and it would be you know a project, but fairly easy to to use those instead. Um, but the rails, um, I just I like how this uh, goes together. I also it's um it was sort of inspired by the uh, MPCNC, uh, which was the first version of the trash printer that I built, and so the um but also it's sort of cheap, it's easy. And um, you really don't need a super high level of accuracy, uh, or at least I've not found that I do uh, for the trash printer. You can sort of get away with uh, something like this and it works. You can get a remarkably high level of accuracy uh, considering sort of how uh, imprecise and sloppy this is. So uh, if you find that you're not getting the accuracy you want, uh, feel free to make improvements. Um, but uh, this is uh, perfectly good enough for my purposes. All right. So I'm just going to check my notes again. Okay. And so um, you're going to find three of these. Um, and we're going to attach uh, lead nuts to them, just like we did. Uh, for the Z bed, uh, and those would be two for the X axis and one for the Y axis. Um, and so it's easier if you just do that before you assemble them. And um, some of these I modified so that the hole's a little bit easier to get to, and uh, some of them I um, are sort of from an older batch, and so those don't fit. So I'm going to find the ones that do fit the lead screws really nicely. Lead nuts, <laughs> I mean. All right. That was nice. Okay. And um, it is possible that you can get these uh, to press fit in here. Um, but um, because they're you know so critical to the motion of the machine, uh, I recommend that you um, put at least two bolts on there. There's three holes, um, and um, so just uh, you know pop those on like that. That's actually really nice. That one. And to see if these screws that I got, or bolts that I got that were too small for the stepper motors, might just fit in here. Ah, yeah, they do. Great. Um, that looks great, actually. Okay, so 12 millimeters for those it is.
And these things can be a little tricky because the um, bolts are so close, or the nuts are so close uh, that they um, don't quite spin freely. So it makes sense to sort of keep it in place on one side and then tighten it down on the other. Really good. You can see that. Cool. That over there. Um, one note is I probably will just like fix this in the file since it's such a trivial small thing. But um, you can see that the uh, lead screw or um, lead nut hangs over the edge of this by just the tiniest little bit, a couple of millimeters maybe. Uh, but it makes it so that the uh, lead nut side has to go on the outside of the assembly. Uh, and if you could make it go on the inside, uh, you would gain a couple more millimeters of uh, travel on uh, a couple of the axes. Um, and so that's a very, very, very minor modification, but one that would be relatively easy to make. Um, and so I'm mostly just noting it so that I can go back and make that change.
So now I'm going to show you how to assemble one of these rollers. Uh, it's probably one of the more you know, tedious things that you have to do, uh, is just do this 16 times. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. And so, well, let's get started. Um, these are 5 16 by 1 inch uh, hex bolts, uh, and the parts are designed to fit them. Um, so I was originally, I thought I could get away with one and a quarter, and you kind of can, but don't if you don't have to. They're also more expensive. Um, and so, um, this one particularly just wants to use regular uh, nuts. You don't have to use um, locking nuts. It's just harder, and uh, there's really not a lot of benefit because the nuts, when the parts are assembled, sort of become captive nuts. So, for each roller, you're going to want two skateboard bearings, two of these 1 inch 5 16 bolts, and then, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of these um, nuts. So I'm going to get these ones out of the way. We're going to assemble one without the uh, lead nuts for now. Um, and um, you do want to keep them separate uh, based on whether they're going to be on the uh, short ways, what I'm calling the X rollers, or if they're going to be on the Y rollers, uh, because the orientation of the um, bolts changes. So let's start by doing one for the X rollers, because we'll do those first. And uh, there's going to be two sets, and one side of one set is going to be one of these that has the lead done in it. Uh, but we'll do that last, so you can just see one without it first. So, first thing you're going to do is you're going to put this bearing onto the bolt. And I'm going to stand up so you can see this a little bit better onto the bolt. And then you just put the nut on there until it's about flush with the end of the bolt. Um, and then it just is designed to lay flat into this pattern. So you line up the bearing and then push this thing in. And um, you can sort of adjust it and you might need to, but basically it's um, you. Every time you turn it, this distance changes. And if it's too much or too little, it won't fit in here. And then you're shooting for them to both be flat uh, like that and not like this with the sort of pointy bit up. Uh, that also, you know, um, would work OK, but it's not what it's designed for. They make a lot better contact if they're just resting in there. So now you can see that it sort of holds that bearing in place. Um, and so we're going to do that. I also, um, the head of the uh, bolt should be up on this top part, inside part, and the actual nut should be on the outside part. Uh, and you can tell because this uh, rectangle is slightly thinner than this rectangle. So now we've got those two lying in there. All right. And then, so this is going to be uh, the shirtways roller. Um, and um, so there's going to be uh, side uh, plates that attach with bolts into these captive nuts. And so for this uh, assembly, the nuts are going to be pointed out that with the hole going out that way and that way. Um, instead of up and down, they're going to be going side to side. So you can attach the plates like this. 
uh, for the Y carriage, the one that carries the extruder around, uh, there's going to be a top plate and a bottom plate. So the holes of the uh, bolts that, or nuts that you put in there are going to be going that way and that way. But because this is a square, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, like the, you don't have to use different parts. The same part works for both. So that would be for the Y carriage, but we're doing the X carriage, so we're going to do it that way. So you want to put these in before you sort of sandwich it all together. It doesn't matter where in here these nuts are sitting because uh, once you tighten uh, a bolt into them, it will pull on them uh, and, and sort of straighten them out. So it doesn't matter where they sit. And you grab the other side of one of these. And again, they're, you know, universal, unidirectional. You can't mess it up, I promise. Um, this uh, side got a little extra toasty from the laser, so we're going to do the pretty side. We'll put that on there. And just sort of make sure it's making good contact. And then if you just hold it, pinch it right in the middle there, you can see that everything stays together and it stays as one thing. So now I'm going to go grab these guys. I need to look this up. I don't remember if these are 832 or 1032, uh, but these are not metric. Um, although I did size this so you could use a M4, I believe. Um, and uh, so it, it doesn't really matter which one you use. Uh, but I had these from a previous build, so I'm going to go with these. And also these have um, corresponding uh, nylon lock nuts. Um, and uh, for these, in a lot of cases, you don't need the, the lock nuts, but for this in particular, uh, it really helps because it's important that these just don't vibrate apart and they're always going to be moving. So um, it doesn't matter which way you put it in, um, but usually you'll face the um, nut side in so that it's a little less visible. I'm going to put this up and through like that. So there's that. And then I'm going to start it just with my fingers. The one annoying thing about the lock washers or lock nuts is that they're hard to get on. Um, but it, I find that if I just hold this uh, nut with my fingers really securely, I can get in there with a screwdriver and sort of tighten it down. And you just don't need to tighten it down more than keeps it together. And then you can test to make sure that the bearings spin freely. And it'll rattle a little bit, that's fine. But uh, there you go. Now we've got our uh, first roller. And to come over here, we'll grab this one inch rail. You can see that it slides nicely along it. So, that's how you know it works. Um, so now we're going to do that again. But we're going to do that again this time with one of the ones uh, with the lead nuts in it. So, let's see. It doesn't really matter um, which side you pick. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to pick one.
if you orient when we assemble it, assemble the X rollers, if you put the lead screw side, lead nut side, um, in uh, inwardly, uh, it'll buy you a couple more millimeters of um, travel. But again, that's a tiny difference. It doesn't really matter. That one. Now we're going to do another one with a lead nut. I notice on this one, this one sort of uh, recesses the lead nut the most. It sort of has it in the middle, mostly. Um, and since, well, let's see. Okay, uh, but for, for the rails to sit across these, which they're gonna, um, this bump here uh, would cause problems. So that's something, that's another reason to change that. Uh, but for now, we're going to not do that. We're 
going to do it this way. Okay, so now we have our two x-axis rollers, or two sets of two, and uh, two with the lead nuts in there. And so we're going to put these aside. And then we're going to start on the ones for the Y roller. Let me make sure I have all these. Yeah. So on this one, only one will have uh, the lead nut in it. Uh, and that's enough to move the whole thing. And so these three are just going to be regular. And for these ones, we're going to want to orient these uh, nuts top-bottom, like I mentioned before.
Again, because of this little extra bump here, unless you want to cut it off, uh, it's got to go on the outside face. So we're going to put it out here and not recessed, which is how I would otherwise do it, except it will push up on uh, the plate. So. Looks pretty good. That one might be even a little too tight. All right. So those will be our Y carriage rollers. And these ones will be our X carriage rollers. Um, and that's pretty neat because we're getting to the end of that assembly. So why don't we just go right into that. Let me just check my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting anything too crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's start with the X rollers. So all of these parts are identical, so it doesn't matter what you use. Again, you can pick, pick the prettier side if you want. With mine, I got some uh, you know smudges over them, so there isn't really a prettier side, which makes it easier. Uh, all right. Okay, so this is again a, like a small detail, but I'm going to have the lead screw or lead nut uh, facing in, uh, in the middle of uh, this thing that we're going to assemble, um, and that'll just keep it from hitting the um, shaft coupler uh, on the lead screw uh, and bias a couple more millimeters of travel. So. It, these things go together in a very similar way to the way that the rollers go together. Uh, these captive nuts that we put in there are going to line up with these holes. I'm just going to put it on like that. So we'll just start it. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, these. Uh, Holes don't seem to be big enough. Classic. All right. Luckily, that's where these um, step drill bits uh, come in really handy. Um, 
So I'm going to make a note. And I want to do this. Um, that's interesting. I must have done quarter 20 holes. I guess they are really close. This one almost like they're just not loose. Um, so. All right, that'll do it. Okay, so I'm going to step outside and just do this outside since um, I don't want the, um, I don't want to contaminate the plastic uh, shavings that I have uh, with wood so that we can recycle them. Well, that was quick and easy at least. Um, the, <clears throat> this is why I like to prototype using um, craft plywood because uh, with wooden parts it's really easy to just go and make these slight modifications that just happen during the uh, prototyping process. Um, it's possible to do that if you were doing something like acrylic. Um, but uh, acrylic is a lot more brittle and um, it just would be a lot more likely to uh, crack. So it's just a lot easier. And acrylic shavings are not the best thing to get everywhere. So wood is a lot better for that. Okay. So for these side plates, um, I use three quarter inch, uh, five sixteenths bolts. If you use one inch, it'll push into the um, rails um, and uh, they'll kind of block it. So you do need three quarters. Uh, for these, I'll make sure I have the uh, updated and accurate quantities for that, uh, so you don't have to buy more than you need. But usually, like a 50 count box of of the one inch and the three quarters will do it. And so I'm not going to tighten these down all the way. We'll do the final things, and it's wood, you know, so you don't want to like um, you don't need to tighten them down uh, too much. All right.
No, did I do that right? I, uh, I wanted, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I did not take my own advice and point the uh, lead nut inward, uh, but it really, it's just like maybe a couple of millimeters. It's not as much of an issue on this axis anyway. So. It's pretty fun because uh, once you assemble uh, this, just the, the way that the layers of wood sort of reinforce each other structurally, it just becomes very strong. Like all of a sudden it's a thing. It's, uh, it's a part. Um, and so let me grab that. So then that will be the roller for the x-axis. Um, that's exciting. All right. Grab my nut driver. Yeah, because these are wooden parts, it is important to not over tighten, um, but it's also good to. Um, give everything just a little bit of a tighten because um, it will pull right towards the edge um, of that. All right. And That's exciting. Now we've got our X rollers. And then, now that those things are placed, um, we can measure and cut the other tubes. 
let's see how these roll in there. Um, you can see in here, let's see, um, these are sized so that the rail not only fits through the holes, but also rests in this sort of channel between the two uh, wooden spacers. And so this whole thing uh, carries the weight of the rail and, and then, of course, the extruder that's going to be on it. So um, we're just going to slide this in. That's great. Cool. So now, now that we've got those done, let me pull this out of the way. So I don't think I need to put that all together in order to know what this dimension is going to be. I am sort of curious though if it doesn't make sense to do this the other way. Because this part spaces the rail in this way um, and we're already dealing with a reduced print area because this is the trash printer mini. Uh, I'm wondering what happens if we just do this. It does seem to buy us a little bit more. These little tabs here, um, well, here, um, these were originally for belts. I've decided not to use belts. Um, and um, so those aren't really necessary, and they do seem to buy us like almost half an inch. So then the question is OK. 
okay, that still can go there. seems to work. And since doing it that way is um, going to be require longer rails and it's much harder uh, to lengthen rails than it is to shorten them, uh, I'm going to try that. Um, yeah, wow. That buys us basically an inch. Um, I'm sure I might find out consequences for doing it that way, uh, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. Now I'm kind of wondering if I originally designed it that way because the bolt holes that I thought wouldn't line up do line up if they're in this orientation. So maybe that was on purpose? Let's see. This is what happens when you build something iteratively over <laughs> years, but particularly at least the last six months. So I don't actually remember how I did this the first time or why I designed it that way in the first place. Um, okay, there's that. Um, This part of the carriage hits this part, um, and so it does reduce the travel in the long dimension. But I'm kind of more concerned, well, I guess that was the dimension that I would be uh, improving. Um, Might just cut these off. Not as elegant as a laser cutter, but
Didn't measure this one, but I'm about to. This one is twenty nine and a half.
that. That's what it's supposed to do. That's really satisfying. I don't think I can get enough of that. All right. So. Now that I've got that, I can see uh, about this lead screw. I suspect that I'm going to have to cut it, but I'm not sure, and I didn't want to cut it until I was sure. Yeah, OK. So this is the Y lead screw, um, and it goes up here, um, and you can put it as as far back as about this, um, and so even if you do that, it will come over by about that much, um, and the way I have it on the other one is more like that. I'm thinking about making some uh, motor spacers so that you can bring this motor at least as far out as this. Um, these screws in the back uh, are metric and you can take them out, but they're also what hold the motor together. And they're also only threaded at the very end. So if you try to put them through something like that, uh, they don't bite and they don't um, screw the whole thing together. So you have to get really long kind of custom special uh, bolts to do that. Um, but if you can just space this out, um, then uh, you recess the um, shaft coupler there a little bit, and uh, it just, again, increases your travel uh, a little bit. And uh, with the mini cart, definitely uh, every little bit helps. So, okay, well this one will have to be cut by at least an inch. Um, and probably up to four, um, because it only really needs to go through there. Um, and if you did, uh, four inches off of this, then it, it would be a 600 millimeter, um, lead screw, which would be the same as, uh, the Z. Uh, so that's good to know. Now, I need to go out and, um, actually, let's see, this is the top. I realized that, you know, these are, this is the first time that I'm sort of building this round of parts uh, from, you know, SketchUp to reality. And so there are all the, always these small uh, modifications that I have to make. But, um, so I have to widen these bolt holes. And also, you can see that this actually, no, that's right. Okay, I was thinking that this hole was off because it didn't match up, but it's actually, I, I did that on purpose so that it would be just wider. So that's the same radius or the same center point, just wider. So that part is right. Um, but I do need to um, widen at least this one before I can test the Y roller. So again, Pardon me.
and check to make sure these measurements are all correct. And then the Y ruler, at least the top part of it. And that's enough to just make sure that all this stuff checks out. So that just, yes. Okay. Oh. Mm -mm. Well. Um, so now we have our side to side. And we have our front and back. <laughs> cool. So that's looking great. Um, once you get the lead screws on there, it won't do that uh, uh, because everything will be locked in place except when the motors are moving them, and that's a good thing. But it is nice to sort of like feel how smoothly it can move uh, when it's free rolling. It really does uh, constrain the uh, movement in a really um, precise way. Okay, so that's pretty good. That's like a, a good step for the um, construction of the physical gantry. Um, and I think that's a good place for me to take a break because uh, I definitely need to drink some water and eat some food. And so I'm going to stop this stream. Um, Follow this uh, channel, Disruptively Useful. Uh, if you're interested in this, you'll get updates on when I'm streaming. And um, otherwise, I'm going to compile all of these notes uh, from this build and some of the video uh, into a sort of more 
uh, concentrated <laughs> format uh, a little bit later on. So stay tuned. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to take off these headphones. All right. Welcome back to day four of this uh, live stream trash printer build. Um, this part of the build is where things get interesting because uh, these are sort of um, there are a couple things that I'm doing differently and a couple things that I've learned about these parts that I need to change, um, which is a little funny, but of course that's why I'm doing this. Um, I'm hoping to do a whole other um, build of this uh, version of the trash printer uh, before the uh, prize in uh, the end of October. It just got moved up to October 23rd. Um, and so I'm going to try and take all the notes that I have from this build and try and do it quicker, better, faster uh, next time. Um, so today, most of the day, I've been just sort of doing some prep work and some problem solving, working around um, some uh, parts that need to be modified and um, also just making some uh, modifications that I think will increase the travel just a little bit. So let me... Get this centered. Cool. All right. And the um, I did a little bit of work uh, today that was off camera. So let me just show you what I did. So I made this what I'm calling the Y carriage, uh, the sort of sliding part, and this part just rests on these rails. Um, and But I forgot that I made a set of these uh, rollers um, for the other trash printer that were slightly longer, that had like uh, a little bit of uh, extra material here. And uh, if you don't have that material, I'm now remembering, uh, you can't put this bottom plate on because it slides along uh, the rail and there's too much friction. Um, and so I just added these bearings in as temporary spacers. I'm going to go fix that in the files. Um, so noted, um, but this just sort of places on there. And so I also like, um, I went outside and I just cut down these parts on the side. Um, that originally I was going to use belts. I, I had originally designed the gantry to use belts and then just realized that lead screws are just better. And so I switched that out, switched it out for lead screws and um, the I just cut off this extra thing because then it doesn't hit here and this can slide out way further. Um, and so it buys us a little bit more travel because with this mini version of the printer, um, the amount of total printable travel area in this dimension, uh, which I'm calling the X, is um, only about 8 inches, which is still not bad. Um, and you can definitely do long objects, um, but uh, that is the most limited dimension and it is quite limited. So I wanted to see what I could do to uh, get that to be um, as much travel as uh, possible. But this, um, this mini version um, is just one of the ver versions. Uh, if you want more build area, all you have to do is build one of these ones, uh, one of the sort of regular size ones. And, um, the uh, build area on that, I believe, is something like 20 by 18 by 24-ish. And uh, this is only about 8 by 18 by 24. Still pretty good. Um, but uh, one of the main reasons that I'm building, um, the, building it this way um, is so that I can travel around and take it in the uh, Magic Tool Bus. So this is sort of the portable version.
So this build is probably going to involve more troubleshooting than I would like, but such is life. So I'm going to take this carriage off. So that I can mark the holes here on these uprights. Um, and I might have to remove these to drill them. Actually, that Sharpie is too thick to get through there. So, I do have this pencil, but I think it's going to be okay. So, I may need to come up with a uh, different solution for doing this. And I think what I will probably do is take one of these, take one of these off, and line it up, and then just drill right through it. So, let's see, I'm going to, that looks pretty good, going to need to go grab some power tools,
Okay, but that works great. Alright, that works exactly as it should. That feels way better, which is great news. Let's see if I can use this piece to mark where this piece should be as like a guide. to go on the in so that the bolts line up. It does seem like that, that will work.
Don't love that. Um, doesn't seem very accurate. And while it doesn't really need to be, I'd love to figure out a better way of doing this.
maybe Then this.
what I'm doing is using this piece as a guide and lining it up on the outside, making sure it's lined up with this. Looks pretty good.
That was annoying. Um, I'm gonna pause and take a water break and cool down because it is very hot in here. <sighs> okay, let's see here. I'm going to take off these headphones. <sighs> All right. Welcome back to day four of this uh, live stream trash printer build. Um, this part of the build is where things get interesting because uh, these are sort of, um, there are a couple things that I'm doing differently and a couple things that I've learned about these parts that I need to change, um, which is a little bit, but of course that's why I'm doing this. Um, I'm hoping to do a whole other um, build of this uh, version of the trash printer uh, before the uh, prize in uh, the end of October. It just got moved up to October 23rd. Um, and so I'm going to try and take all the notes that I have from this build and try and do it quicker, better, faster uh, next time. Um, so today, most of the day, I've been just sort of doing some prep work and some problem solving, working around um, some uh, parts that need to be modified, and um, also just making some uh, modifications that I think will increase the travel just a little bit. So let me get this centered. Cool. All right. And the, um, I did a little bit of work uh, today that was off camera, so let me just show you what I did. So I made this 
what I'm calling the Y carriage, uh, the sort of sliding part. And this part just rests on these rails. Um, and But I forgot that I made a set of these uh, rollers um, for the other trash printer that were slightly longer, that had like uh, a little bit of uh, extra material here. And uh, if you don't have that material, I'm now remembering, uh, you can't put this bottom plate on because it slides along uh, the rail and there's too much friction. Um, and so I just added these bearings in as temporary spacers. I'm going to go fix that in the files. Um, so noted, um, but this just sort of places on there. And so I also like, um, I went outside and I just cut down these parts on the side um, that originally I was going to use belts. I, I had originally designed the gantry to use belts and then just realized that lead screws are just better. And so I switched that out, switched it out for lead screws and um, the I just cut off this extra thing because then it doesn't hit here and this can slide out way further um, and so it buys us a little bit more travel because with this mini version of the printer, um, the amount of total printable travel area in this dimension, uh, which I'm calling the X, is um, only about eight inches, which is still not bad. Um, and you can definitely do long objects, um, but uh, that is the most limited dimension and it is quite limited. So I wanted to see what I could do to uh, get that to be um, as much travel as uh, possible. But this, um, this mini version um, is just one of the versions. Uh, if you want more build area, all you have to do is build one of these ones, uh, one of the sort of regular size ones. And, um, the uh, build area on that, I believe, is something like 20 by 18 by 24-ish. Um, and uh, this is only about 8 by 18 by 24. Still pretty good. Um, but uh, one of the main reasons that I'm building, um, the, building it this way um, is so that I can travel around and take it in the uh, Magic Tool Bus. So this is sort of the portable version. So this build is probably going to involve more troubleshooting than I would like, but such is life. So I'm going to take this carriage off. So that I can mark the holes here on these uprights. Um, and I might have to remove these to drill them. Actually, that Sharpie is too thick to get through there. So, I do have this pencil, but I think it's going to be okay. So I may need to come up with a uh, different solution for doing this. And I think what I will probably do is take one of these, take one of these off. And line it up and then just drill right through it. 
So let's see. I'm going to. That looks pretty good. Gonna need to go grab some power tools. I'm also going to, now that I sort of have a better idea of how this is all going to go together, um, I'm going to take these off and I'm both going to secure the Z motors and I'm going to just line them up um, because these holes could actually be shrunk a little bit so that they line up a little bit more perfectly.
looks pretty good. Um, we'll see how that affects the rail placement. Still looks pretty good. flip this over and see how the placement of the wheels affects the lead screws. Placement is actually pretty perfect. It doesn't actually go all the way down uh, and hit. Um, but the resistance on the bed is still a little bit higher than I would like, and I'm not sure why that is. I have to take these off anyway so that I can um, put the um, Z motors on there. So I'm just going to take this off and um, see what's going on down there. It probably will be that I just need to wind the holes a little bit because if the um, If the holes are um, too tight and it's rubbing against the plastic, that will cause um, resistance. And you really want this connection to be as free rolling as possible.
can see that one fell down and like lead screws that have low resistance will do that. Just the weight of the lead screw itself will be enough to push it down. So that one worked really well. But these other ones seem to be kind of up against the plastic. Our lead nuts still seem to be in the correct position, and that's good because um, sometimes, because they are under pressure, um, they can pull out. But because they're on the downward side, at least on this version, uh, you don't have to put in screws. I don't think I had to do that on the other side because I did it the other way around. Um, but I think that it's that these holes could stand to be drilled out slightly. Let me see, I've got a drill bit that can handle that. So that one's That's what you want.
All right. I'm going to put this in as a stop so that I don't accidentally drill into the lead nut itself. You know, it could be that one works great. It may be that I put the wrong lead nut in there. Because um, I did have a different type at one point. Um, and it starts on all of these just great. Start on that one. And I don't currently have a good answer why. It's possible that one got damaged somehow. Really interesting. Okay. I don't think any of my lead screws um, match that. Yeah, I think that that is a lead, lead nut that I had extra that is the wrong pitch. Okay, that seems to be Aha! Uh -huh. So these two lead screws that I have, uh, which were from an older version of the trash printer, these two are a shorter pitch. Um, so the distance that they turn per single revolution is less, um, which is interesting. So I need to see if I can find a different lead screw. Now I'm wondering if that's the case on the other ones that I already installed over here. That one fits and works great. Uh, 
That one fits and looks great. That one does not fit or work great. Okay. So that's why, which is at least uh, helpful. So what I need to do is take this one off. news is, if you buy lead screws, um, they should just come with uh, the lead nuts that um, correspond. So you won't need to do this, uh, and that does explain why the Z-bed was not behaving the way that I was hoping that it would. So that's cool. Um, I'm still going to drill this one out. Much better. Also makes me wonder if I will eventually have to switch out these um, lead screws um, these were the only ones that I could get uh, on Amazon really fast uh, in order to do this uh, build on schedule. Um, and so uh, for the Z, because it's going to be holding weight, um, sometimes if you don't have the motors powered, it will just... And um, so having uh, lead screws with a tighter pitch tends to prevent that from happening. Uh, at least as my current understanding. So, I'll put this back down here. And we'll see how we use it.
So I ordered these in two different sets, uh, one set of four and one set of uh, just this one. And I did not check the um, uh, specifications close enough. So um, this is um, a, this is the right one. This should go with the Z. I just like uh, mix them up when I put them all together. So I have the right parts. Uh, I just need to go cut this one. All right, so let that be a lesson to at the very least always get lead screws of consistent pitch because um, these were the same type of um, lead screw but um, one has a much different pitch um, and uh, I'll report back on which one works better but that almost certainly explains why the Z wasn't behaving the way that I was expecting it to because they all fit in there but only the um, one of them was trying to turn at a different um, rate or raise the bed at a different rate than the other one um, and so that definitely would have caused problems uh, when trying to print Now I'm putting these in backwards for now so that I can get to the steppers and put in those screws, bolts I should say.
Okay. So now I've got these and put these around. Hopefully, this will let the Z bed perform a lot better. I guess it's nice that I caught that now at this step rather than later when I was trying to get it all running for the first time. Don't know which bolt I was using. This is not the right one.
All right, and the resistance on this one seems like it's a little higher than the other ones. And I think it's because of just like where the motor is sitting over. So I'm gonna unscrew these and sort of move it over until I find like a, that's pretty good. Okay. Don't you hear it when you learn things? Um, so this one, because I had used this shaft coupler um, for the other, I was going to use it for the other axis, I had done the um, coupling slightly different in a way that made it a little bit longer and so it sticks down through the bottom um, differently than the other ones and then that causes it to uh, have more resistance because it has to travel through and I think it's hitting the 
So I have to undo this one. There it goes. I think I also just cut it slightly differently because I use a slightly different measurement. Well, got to cut it again. This is the price you pay for doing things wrong. And hopefully, me doing it wrong a bunch saves someone somewhere sometime. Sometime. Maybe I'll actually measure it this time.
Ooh, okay, but that works great. Right. That works exactly as it should. That feels way better, which is great news. Let's see if I can use this piece to mark where this piece should be as like a guide. Needs to go on the corner in so that the bolts line up. But it does seem like that, that will work.
Don't love that. Um, doesn't seem very accurate. And well, it doesn't really need to be. I'd love to figure out a better way doing this. Maybe Then this.
works pretty well. So what I'm doing is using this piece as a guide and lining it up on the outside, making sure it's lined up with this.
That was annoying. Um, I'm gonna pause and take a water break and cool down because it is very hot in here. <clears throat> okay, welcome back to what will hopefully be uh, the last installment of this uh, live trash printer build. Um, I took a break for a couple of days because the last time that uh, I was working on this um, if you were watching the stream, you may have tell, uh, noticed that I was getting a little frustrated um, because I had some issues with the lead screws. I bought the, the wrong lead screws. Um, the lead screws that I'm using for this one, the ones that I know work, are T8 by 8, 8 millimeter lead um, lead screws. Um, and so those are four start. So they're two millimeter pitch for start, you don't necessarily need to know what that means, um, but the uh, pitch times the uh, number of starts equals the lead, which is the amount of distance that it uh, moves in one rotation. And so um, the um, eight millimeter ones uh, turn a lot easier. Um, and I had gotten the wrong ones, and so, and I had installed it actually on just one of the um, Z bed uh, lead screws. And so the, the bed was just not behaving the way that I thought because three of them were the right size, and one of them uh, was the wrong size. And it was actually the one that was supposed to be for the Y. Anyway, so I, uh, I took a break. Uh, for a couple of days, and I ordered some stuff on Amazon, uh, some new stuff to try, including the lead screws. And uh, but now I'm back at it, and today we're going to get the uh, rest of the electronics on here, 
and we're gonna um, do some programming, see if we can get it moving. Um, I'll probably do a more detailed video on the actual programming and the firmware and the software that you use and all of that. Um, but uh, we'll see how much we can do. All right. So where we left off was we had the whole mechanical um, parts of the gantry uh, set up. Um, but right now they're just, you know, free moving. Uh, and so we're going to install the lead screws and we're going to install the stepper motors. Um, and uh, then we're going to put the extruder in there and we're just going to start going along with the wiring. I'm going to try something a little different for this build, so it, it may fail spectacularly, but that's how you learn. It's at least how I learned. Um, and um, so um, I made this little like bracket out of an old um, part um, to hold the uh, control board here. Uh, this is a Rambo 1.4 board um, and I'm going to see if I can mount the board onto the carriage, the Y carriage itself um, because I think that just might simplify things and not make for such a rat's nest of wires like you see over there. Um, one of the things that I learned by doing this project is that uh, a big part of building good 3D printers is good cable management. Um, so I'm trying to get better at that every time, and uh, we'll see if I'm successful at that. All right. So you'll notice that this last plate here on the Y is uh, currently taken off. And I took that off so that I can mount the stepper motor here. And so this is going to go in here and so you can do it um, the other way with this uh, installed but it's a lot easier if you don't and also you'll get a little bit more travel in this direction the closer you can get this motor or the uh, shaft coupler to the end of the motor so I'm only leaving about maybe a quarter inch there just enough for it to bite onto uh, the lead screw um, and so that way it recesses um, the shaft coupler uh, as much as possible. You'll still lose some over here, but um, that's a problem for a different build. So I'm going to put these um, M3 uh, bolts in here. I'm just going to start them with my fingers. Um, I have a limited number of these and I haven't gotten a chance to go to the hardware store slash I haven't remembered to. Um, and so uh, I'm just using two. Um, in my experience, two is totally sufficient. Um, but if you're trying to do this the right way, um, you should use four. So that was easy. Now we've got our Y stepper motor in there. Um, and this stepper motor I'm using is a really high power one. It's basically the um, most powerful NEMA 17 stepper motor that I could find. I think it's something like 100 ounce in ounce inches of torque. Um, and um, I was using a smaller one on this one and it seemed to uh, work fine. But sometimes you can get uh, these little goops of plastic that will then um, solidify. And when the nozzle comes around again for the next layer, um, it can sometimes hit that blob of goop and it can create a little bit of back pressure. And that can cause the gantry or the stepper motor to skip. And if it skips, if you don't have a closed loop system, which I don't, um, it, uh, it will ruin your print because you'll be off by however many steps it lost. Um, so I'm going to try out this uh, more powerful motor and see how that works. So you're just going to put the Y carriage all the way over there. You're going to slide the lead screw in from here. This is a 600 
millimeter T8 by 8 lead screw. And then you can see it starts moving the carriage. Once you get the, the lead screws on here, um, it's locked in place. It really doesn't move very much. And right now it's like it, you can move it around like this. But once you have the lead screws, well, once you have the lead screws locked in, uh, it's, it's really quite rigid. So I'm just going to tighten these down. All right, looks pretty good. All right, and then, um, so yeah, you can see now I can't really move this at all. And so now we're gonna do the same thing, uh, but for the X uh, dimension. So I'm gonna grab these steppers here. I have the steppers uh, for the X axis and the Z axis um, connected in series. I have this done already because it's hard to sort of remember which way is which. But I'll post a picture of exactly the way that it's supposed to go together. Um, but doing this um, is just they're quieter and they perform better. Um, and I recommend doing that way. But I'll post a diagram um, or a detailed picture um, so you can see how that looks. All right. So... Same thing. Oh, actually, this is the things that you learn when you actually build stuff. Um, I took this apart a little bit because I skipped ahead when I was frustrated. Um, and um, But I realized that um, here are those shaft couplers. And you want, the same way with this one, like I said, you want to put the shaft coupling on first. Before you put it in here, it'll go right through that hole. Um, and with this one, you can put it down basically so there's no gap here. Um, just enough so that it doesn't rub. Um, and if you do it that way, then you'll gain a couple of extra millimeters of travel. And while it's not the biggest deal in the world, um, this is limited in the x dimension to about eight inches and so anything we can do to just increase that as much as we can the effective print area goes a long way um, because this the parts this thing can print uh, if you want them to be square or a vase or a circle then you're limited to eight uh, or whatever the dimension is in the shortest dimension um, you're limited to that in both directions, even though the uh, print area this way is almost 18 inches. Um, so just anything we can do. I mentioned this in the other video, but like this one is mostly for demonstration purposes. I wanted to know if you could use the smaller cart um, and how it would work. But mostly I wanted to have a mini version of the trash printer that would take up less space and fit more easily into uh, the Magic Tool Bus, which is a um, shuttle bus that I have uh, that I'm about to live out of full time. And I want to be able to travel around with the trash printer and show people how, to, how it works and how to build their own. And so this is sort of the mobile version. If you have space, the difference in cost between uh, the small version and the big version is like 30 or 40 bucks. And um, that one has a much, much bigger um, print area because the shorter dimension isn't quite as short. Uh, but the Z and the Y are almost the same. So, all right, there's that.
It's important, I think I mentioned, that it doesn't matter what kind of head you use on the, uh, the metric um, hardware. Uh, but I'm realizing now that in the, for the same reason, the, uh, these countersink ones work really well because then you know, they don't stick out as much. Um, and so I'll make a note of that. But you can use any ones you want, like the flathead or the um, uh, you know, cap head. Um, but the countersink ones go into the wooden parts really nicely. Okay, and so now, same thing, we're going to push this right against here. And we're going to grab these lead screws. Um, these ones are 400 millimeters. And we're going to feed them in there. And now we're going to back it off just a little bit. I'm going to make sure it's making good contact in there. Tight and tight. All right, that's as much as we're going to get in that direction. So, that's looking pretty good. Okay. Now we're going to take this other Y plate. I'm just going to put this back on here. And it just press fits onto the um, rails here. So if you want to, you don't even really have to um, put the bolts in there, but it does make it stronger. It sort of stiffens the whole thing up. Okay, so that was easy. Now we've got our motors. Um, and so it's a lot more rigid now. And so we can grab our extruder. I made a couple of modifications to the extruder. All um, This is sort of a test, so I'm going to make a... Uh, like detail uh, about this. I decided to go for, try out a um, wider nozzle uh, than I tried on the other one and um, do things just slightly different, use a different heater, um, but it's uh, mostly the same. And it's one of those things where you get something, you go into these band heaters on here uh, and you get the tip heater. Um, 
and then you can kind of use whatever um, fittings you can find uh, as a nozzle and try them out. Um, I've had really good luck with compression fittings and with the hose barb uh, fittings. Um, the compression fittings, the um, like nozzle part ends up being a little thinner, and I think that transfers heat better. Um, but we'll see. So I also had to sort of modify this. A lot of the parts in this build uh, were sort of my first time trying this out like directly from everything that's in the model. And so I had to modify a couple of things because they didn't quite fit. Um, and so I'm going to modify those files so that you won't have to do this. Uh, but I added this little like uh, mount here so that I could easily mount the extruder. So I'm going to put this down here. And I want this to be facing, uh, the hopper to be facing that way because this is going to be the back of the machine. up through here if they'll fit. And that'll hold the extruder in place. On my previous builds, I like haven't had a super easy way to change out the extruders. Um, but my goal is to make it easier and easier so that they're swappable. Um, because once a uh, extruder is um, has been run, um, you can cycle through different plastics, but different plastics all have different properties and often different melting points. Um, and so it's best if you just have one extruder for polypropylene and one extruder for HDPE and so on. Um, I uh, think that there's a good chance that the trash printer could also print. Like I've tried printing um, number two and number five. Um, and um, I'm pretty sure uh, that PLA and number one um, and a number of other plastics could also be printable with it. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to it. So if you do build one, uh, totally try that out and let me know how it goes. Okay, now we have the uh, extruder on there starting to look like a trash printer. So now we've got the two sides of our Z and we've got our X and our Y and our E and our heaters and our thermistors. So that's all of the electronics. Um, so the next phase is wiring. So I'm going to just manually twist these to get them to go out so I have a little bit more room to work here. Great. And then I have this um, top mounting plate. Uh, but for now, because I'm testing here, I want access to these bolts. And it's mostly just for uh, looks. Uh, I can't get it on there now that I've done this. Um, so that's going to be in the set of files, and you can use it if you want. Uh, but you don't have to use it, and I'm not going to.
So I'm gonna try out adding this back plate here. Uh, and I did this by just turning um, two of uh, these bolts here and here. I turned them sideways uh, instead of face up uh, like, um, well, like the rest of these. Um, and so that lets me mount this plate to the side here. Okay. Oh, you know what? I'm going to try out one of the special perks you support my Patreon is you get access to this Twitch channel that I have. Okay. So I'm muted, but if you're watching the stream, and you join the Discord channel if you're a patron and you're on the Discord. In theory, your voice should come through by TV in near real time. And I should be able to uh, answer questions or just chat. Um, and uh, I've never tried that out before. So I just activated that. Uh, if you um, are watching and want to try that out, feel free. Um, and uh, if you're not a patron and would like to support this project, you can, and uh, that's one of the perks you get. Um, there's no like special information that you get. Everything that I make is fully open source, and I just document it as I document it. Um, but um, you know, you get uh, like to know that you're <laughs> making it happen. All right. So now I'm going to mount this control board on here with the stepper motor side row up there. Okay. That looks pretty good. Um, something I didn't test was if these wires are going to hit. Oh no, that's got great clearance. Okay, awesome. Cool. So now we're going to make a cable guide and I've been making these cable guides. I made the cable guide for this one. Um, just using this um, 10 millimeter coroplast. Uh, there's a link to it in the parts. Uh, it's like that corrugated plastic uh, that you see or, uh, for like political lawn signs and stuff. Uh, but that stuff is four millimeters. This is 10 millimeters. So it's thicker and it's stronger. And uh, most importantly, you can fit wires through uh, the corrugations there. Um, and it's really just easy to cut and score, and it's light, and it just happens to be made out of polypropylene, which is the plastic the trash printer prints with. So if you have any scraps, uh, you can shred them up and feed them to your printer, just like the uh, offcuts and um, bits from the drilling from making the trash printer. So once you start looking for it, you'll realize that polypropylene is everywhere. Um, so I'm going to find something that I can use as a guide here. I think I'm going to use this, which is one of the solid state relays that we'll use a little bit later. And I don't 
really have a good work surface here. Um, I'm going to pull out this table. And then just using this as a basic guide, these don't all have to be really all that straight uh, or uh, all that accurate. And you're just going to score, which with a sharp razor blade, just takes a couple of really light, just sort of rolling over the thing. And then we'll create a score. And then you can just pop it open like that. And you can see the. Um, Corrugations inside. We're just going to do that all the way down the length. The straighter you can do this, the better. Um, but in my experience, it doesn't really matter all that much. If you have a speed square or a T square or something like that, that would work great for this. Uh, I'm just live and lazy. Okay, so we'll test this out. <laughs> and just fold each of these back, and then sometimes if your cuts aren't quite straight, you can just kind of bend it. Polypropylene is a very forgiving, flexible material. Okay, so you just need to make sure that it can go all the way over to about here, and then all the way back. So that looks really good. I wonder if this would be easier if it could mount like here. So I think that'll do it. Yeah, I think that's good. Cool. So now we have this. Nifty cable guide. And I 
And so it doesn't really matter which way you mount it, um, but um, you'll want your cables going off to one side. I think I'm gonna do it this way because that's what, the way I have it on the other one, kind of like that. Um, and then I'm gonna use this tool. This is called a coral claw, uh, and it's a tool made specifically for cutting this kind of material uh, along the corrugations. And so um, last time I did this, I did the uh, cuts on the outside, and I'm gonna try cutting them on the inside this time because then that way um, they're always accessible. You can get in there, uh, and I think that'll work fine. And uh, if it doesn't, we'll find out. So you just want to hook, if you are using one of these, you can use a, do a razor blade, but you just want to hook it not with both in there. That would cut the whole thing. You just want this one in there so that it just scores it. And then you just run it along like that. And so now you got this nice rigid thing and you can push uh, wires in there. And that also makes it a little bit more flexible. Okay. So part of the reason that I wanted to mount the um, uh, control board here on the Y carriage um, is because the things that require the most power and are just the most critical uh, to the functioning of the printer uh, are the E-axis extruder or E-axis motor, the extruder motor, um, and the thermistors and the heaters. And so I figured that if I could just like shorten the length of cable uh, that's needed to uh, connect those, um, that that would be better than running a long cable, but it works fine on this one. Um, so um, you can mount it to the sides here. Um, now, let's see.
some of these cables are from some of the uh, original builds of the trash printer. And they are very ugly. Okay, so what I was looking for that whole time was just a header on here so that I can put, uh, connect this to the control board. Um, doesn't have to be very long because this is already long enough. Um, so I'm actually, I think I want this one to be longer. So I'm actually going to steal, I'm going to keep this one long. that to this. So now I'm going to steal this one. The wires on the E-axis motor carry the most power out of all of them. And um, so of all of them, that's the one that it's most important that you have like um, thick wires because they're going to be carrying uh, the highest amount of amps. Um, and so um, these ones, I think I would rather not be using, um, but uh, they're what I have. And I've been trying to find like higher gauge uh, stepper motor headers uh, so I don't have to like make them or solder them. Um, but um, I just sort of have used what I have in the past and that's worked well enough. Um, although um, the extruder motor, uh, the more power you can get out of it, the better.
Okay. So, I'm going to use these lever lock connectors here, um, which are great, and uh, I'm a big fan. Um, you can solder all of the wires, but it's a pain, especially if you're not um, already really confident with um, soldering. Uh, and for me, when I was first starting this project, uh, making good solid solders the first time around and just having to make like 30 of them, um, at least, um, was definitely a barrier to entry for me. Um, so I'm trying to see if like uh, I can do this without any soldering or heat shrinking or any of that. Um, and uh, that's worked pretty well on this one. This, this is connected entirely with those and it works great. Um, and so you do want to make sure that you strip the wire back about a half an inch, like, um, and uh, make sure that you insert them. There's actually a, um, basically this, I believe, back here is the guide. Uh, on the back of this, it shows you how far the wire uh, with the jacket should be inserted. Um, so there's some tricks to them to get good connections, um, but it really does uh, make a big difference. So you can see here, I matched these all up, just, you know, same color to same color. Um, you can see that these wires are quite thick and these wires are quite a bit thinner. That's less than ideal, but it's going to work for now. Um, and it might be just something I'll switch out in the future and it'll be easy to do because of these connectors. So um, I'm going to clean all this up, but first I'm just going to um, connect all this for testing. Um, I do have, let's see, how do I? The blue wires on mine on that one are all facing that way. If you're um, we're going to connect that to the E0 port on the board. Um, if you find when you're building a 3D printer um, that your um, motor is moving in the opposite direction than you want it to, you can invert it in the uh, software slash firmware, um, but you can also just take the wires out and physically switch them back, and they're reversible in that way. So um, try and get it right the first time, but if you don't, it's not the end of the world. You'll know, and then you can uh, put your thing down, flip it, and reverse it. Um, okay. Now, these ones already have pretty long cables which is good because they're some of the ones that are going to have to go through that cable guide. We'll see how much we have here. And this, on the um, Rambo board and a lot of boards, there will be two outputs for the Z because it's common for um, 3D printers to have two Z lead screws, so they run them in parallel. So these two headers are connected in parallel, and then we have two sets of uh, stepper motors that are connected in series. So it's a 2S or 2P2S configuration. Um, and so we'll connect one of these to the Z, and we'll do it on the side that it's facing, because why not? connect the other one to the other one. Um, and so that's both of our Z's and our E. All right. And now this is going to be our X. Now we just have to do our Y. And um, generally, it probably would make sense to do the whole cable guide uh, and run all the wires first. But 
because I'm testing and this is sort of, you know, uh, experimental build, um, I think I'm just going to try and power it up and connect to it and see if I can get any just initial motion and just make sure everything's moving the way that it should. Um, when you connect stepper motors, um, generally, so it goes from one side to the other. If you start with black, you got black, and next to black is always green, um, at least if you're using the black, green, red, blue color scheme. So next to black is always green, and then next to green is red, and then next to red at the end, on the other side is blue. So um, these, the black and green, and the red and blue are the two uh, phases of the stepper motor. Um, stepper motors are fascinating, and I can't explain them that well, but um, it make, it, it's important that those always go the right way together. Uh, all right. So now I need one more set uh, with headers on there, which I think, fortunately, I have. Fine with these um, for using these uh, snap connectors, it is always a good idea to just give the wires a little bit of a twist. Make sure make sure that when you put it in there, it actually goes into the terminal. So then, on the other side, you're just going to match up the colors. So black to black, and then green to green, and then red to red, and then blue to blue. We're probably going to have to add uh, an extension in here, um, but um, that also uh, these are really good for that as well. Um, so this will be our Y motor. And it should go like that. All right. So that's all of our stepper motors. And let's see. We're also going to need to get the board power before we can do much.
So I already have this one. This is like a, a little power header board that will come with the uh, Rambo board. Um, the Rambo boards that I'm using here are what I started using because they were what um, the um, MPCNC, the mostly printable CNC, and the Lowrider 2 uh, recommended. And so they're the ones that I know work. Um, and, um, but they're getting hard to find. Um, and so one of the like known issues that if you are a 3D printer person, I would beseech you to um, try and uh, solve this problem is um, the uh, figuring out how to do this um, with a different control board because um, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Um, Need to find a tiny screwdriver, which I may need to run to the bus to do. I know that I had one around here somewhere, but that's not that helpful. Okay. I think it would be quicker for me to just run, for, run to the bus. So bear with me. I'm going to stay streaming. I'll be back. What we're going to do here is um, connect this last set here. So we're going to back this off a little bit. And we're going to get those in. You want it to be red, black, red, black, red, black. And you want to make sure that there are no stray bits of copper or um, just sort of exposed copper that could potentially uh, hit the other ones. Um, all right. And you're going to want those to be as tight as possible. So what we're going to do, the, the Rambo has inputs that are independent for the logic, the heaters, and uh, the motors. And so you can put in different power supplies if you want, uh, but in our case, we're just gonna use one. So we're gonna do a three to one lever lock connector, and we're gonna combine all of these into one input that we can then connect to our power supply. And that will give the board power. And then, once the board has power, we can connect it to a USB cable uh, and we can connect it to the computer and we can see if uh, we can control the printer, connect to it through a program called Repetier Host. In order to do that, when you first get the board, you're going to have to flash the board, or uh, that is program it, um, with um, a 3D printer firmware called Marlin, which is open source software and it's amazing. Um, and um, you won't really need to understand all of it. I sure don't. 
Um, although you will have to understand Arduino and how to upload a sketch to it, but um, I'll post documentation for how I do that. Um, and um, But this board already has Marlin flashed onto it, so for testing purposes, we're going to skip that step. And you can always reflash Marlin on there, so sometimes you'll be having an issue, like I was having an issue with um, thermal runaway, which is when the printer stops printing because it um, senses a temperature condition that is sort of outside what it expects, and it shuts down the printer because um, it assumes that, you know, maybe something isn't working right and that could cause a fire or, or whatnot. Um, looks like there's a little bit of delay on the camera. All right. So, these handy 3, 2, 1 lever lock connectors um, will allow us to combine all of these into one set uh, quickly and easily uh, without using. So I like to use the blue because it's darker. I like to do that to black like it's the um, negative. The lever lock connectors don't care, um, but it's best to use a system that at least makes sense to you, and this makes sense to me. All right, so now I've got all of the black going in there. Um, it's easier to see from that side. All the black going into the blue side, and now I'm going to connect all of the red going into the orange side. And then I'm going to take this little pin. These things are um, these ones are rated for eight amps, um, and um, we're only going to be we are, our power supply is only six, um, so we don't have to worry about it being uh, too powerful. Um, and so it looks like a lot of wires going into smaller wires, which is generally something that you want to be careful of. Um, whenever you have something with larger wires going into something with smaller wires, uh, you want to make sure that you know you're able to carry uh, the power uh, that is required. But in this case, I know that these can. All right. So now we have this going to this barrel socket. All right. And then it's never a bad idea to just double double check uh, the polarity. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so negative is on the bottom. That fits. And I'm just going to take a photo with my phone here um, so that I have this for reference because I know that uh, you can't see it. Now we've got power, and our power supply is over here. This is a 24-volt, 6-amp power supply. 
which can supply uh, 144 watts, um, which is totally enough excluding the power that we're going to feed into this uh, band heater down here. Um, that's going to be controlled uh, by a solid state relay in between. So the, um, the board doesn't actually have to drive that much power. OK, let me find the other side of this cable. Extension cord over here. <sighs> All right. So now the power supply has power. So now I'm going to plug in the board. I'm going to put the power supply here. All right, and it's flashing. That's a good sign. And now I'm going to plug in this USB cable. All right. And the computer likes it. So I'm gonna open up Repeteer Host. And just so let's see. Um, I'm going to over here and I'm going to turn on my display I'm just going to hope that you can actually see what I'm doing here and that you can see the printer. But hopefully you'll be able to see Rep to your host here. And um, you'll also uh, be able to see if this works and if it works, how it works. So it says disconnected trash printer down here. So we're going to go up here and we're going to hit connect. That looks pretty good. It's reading zero degrees for the um, thermistors because we don't have those connected right now. That doesn't mean it's not connected. <laughs> I just hit the extruder button by accident, uh, and it's not going to do anything because it's locked uh, so that it won't extrude um, when it's um, not uh, heat it up. So that's why we have those. Um, let's see. It's not letting me do the EEPROM. Let me check.
Okay. Well, usually there's this um, setting over here, which is the firmware EEPROM uh, configuration. Um, and it usually lets you, or it lets me, like, um, change the um, steps per millimeter that the thing wants to move. Um, and I don't actually know uh, what this wants to move. So I'm going to try moving it. We'll see. Okay. It did a thing. <laughs> okay. So that means it's working, but it's also... Um, Let's see. Not it's not calibrated. Oh, okay. That's the Y, and it is moving. Or no, that's the X, and it is moving. And the reason it was making that sound is because I was going in the wrong direction, and it was hitting uh, the. Um, it, it was bottoming out at the end of its travel. So, if I go 10 millimeters this way, hey, all right. That may or may not be 10 millimeters. Let's try. All right. So, I don't believe that the rotation of these are calibrated quite right because that doesn't look like 50 millimeters to me. 50 millimeters should be roughly two inches. Uh, and so this would be a situation where you need to calibrate the steps per millimeter. Um, also, I guess I should say I, I didn't do this. Um, so, you know, uh, do as I say, not as I do. But um, it's always good to move the uh, gantry into the middle if you're going to test things like this so that if it goes the wrong way, it doesn't hit. Usually the stepper motors will just you know, buzz at you, bzzz, and they'll kind of vibrate, but it can damage the machine in, in some situations, so uh, be careful of that. Um, and uh, okay, so that's cool. The Y works. Um, and so now let's try, oh, the X works. Now let's try the Y. Um, also, you're going to want, I could go in either direction here, but it thinks that we're at zero, uh, which is sort of the home position. And so if you hit negative one, it won't work, and you'll think your stepper motors don't work or your wiring doesn't work. And really, it's just because it won't go beyond zero uh, unless you give it a command that will uh, disable that feature. So let's see what happens when I do this. All right. That moves too. That's pretty good. All right. That looks great. Now, always start low and then work up. Okay, now let's try 10. All right. It moves. That's a great step. All right. And now let's do 50. Great. Okay. Cool. So now we know that our two axes work um, and that the positive motion is this way for the Y and that way for the X, which means that over here uh, in this sort of back corner is our, where our home position wants to be, because anywhere out here is in the positive values. Uh, and generally, when you reset, when you turn off the um, board and then give it power again, it will just take whatever position it's in and assume that's home. Um, we are, at some point, going to add end stops. And the end stops are little sensors that it, it will just move towards them until it clicks and it gets the feedback that knows that that's where it stops. Uh, and so you can use that to home the router or the uh, printer too. And that's ultimately, when you have a tuned printer, the way to do it because it's way easier and it's automated. Um, but you don't need them to um, sort of troubleshoot you just need to be aware that it is possible that the machine will run into um, places that it can't go or shouldn't go. So you may well need to hit the emergency stop. Um, but that's really good. The only thing that's wrong right now is that um, 
I believe there's a setting in the firmware that enables that EEPROM setting. Uh, and I don't believe I have it enabled in the new firmware, but I did in the old firmware. Um, and so it used to let me update that just directly through the program, which was really handy. Um, and, uh, but I need to go in and I need to change that in the firmware. Um, so now let's see what happens with the Z. All right, makes noise. That's a good sign. But that was into the negative. So they are moving. Let's try. OK. So what it thinks is positive is actually negative. Um, so for the Z motors, I could either invert them or um, I could um, I could like uh, flip around the wires, which is probably what I will do, but let's just see. It actually is letting me go beyond negative. So I guess that that um, protection is not actually enabled. Oh, but that's great. I'm going to move this out of the way, so um, I believe you can still see the top-down view. I'm going to switch back. So I'm going to go to OBS. Whoa! <laughs> and I'm going to turn off the display capture. Hey there. Hello again. Um, OK. And then I'm going to go back to Repeteer. And I'm just going to keep doing that. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to raise the bed sort of all the way up, which is where it's going to need to be eventually. Interestingly, the z-axis does seem to be calibrated the correct way. Um, but that does make sense because most default printers um, use these types of lead screws or commonly use these lead screws. Um, uh, for the Z, uh, and then often we'll use belts or um, different lead screws or different mechanisms for the X and the Y. Um, so it also means when I get into the firmware, I can see what it thinks the step per millimeter, millimeter is for the Z, and then I can just put that over uh, for the X and the Y because I know they're using the same lead screws, which means the steps per millimeter will be the same. Um, but the fact that that all just worked on the first try is, of course, what I expected and <laughs> uh, totally how it always happens. Um, but, uh, but that's really great because that means that everything is working the way that it's supposed to. Another good thing that we can test right now is the height of the nozzle and making sure that the bed can, in fact, um, go up uh, all the way to it because it's possible to build the bed, which is what I did actually uh, the first time I built this, where the, the nozzle didn't like hang down enough uh, and the bed couldn't go high up enough uh, for them to actually meet each other. And so I had to raise it up, um, like uh, I had to add a spacer in between. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't actually reach uh, the extrusion nozzle. But this is looking great. All right. Okay. And so that just made contact with the nozzle. And it looks like we have 
about maybe five-ish millimeters um, of lead screw still that we could go up. Uh, we don't want to because it'll start raising up uh, the whole assembly here. Um, but the fact that we can and that we've got a little bit of headroom there is really great. Um, so that's really exciting. And once you've got this tested, really the next uh, like most important step is then just lengthening uh, the cables. Once you know that they fit, you can just sort of cut them, splice them with the uh, four wire lever lock connectors, add in a length of cable, and so you can keep the connectors however they are, you can just lengthen them, and so it makes it really easy. So, um, let's see what, um, I need to go into the firmware and uh, change those settings which might be a good time to do that. I can pull up my screen again. We can go back down the rabbit hole. Um, so, um, I don't think I'm going to get into the uh, thermistors or heaters today because um, I want to make sure that I'm doing that right. And I've only got so much energy for today. Um, but this is really great progress. It's moving. It's got power. Um, it's really, really, really close. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to turn on that display capture again. Um, I'm going to go to Arduino here. And so, um, I just um, rebuilt uh, this version of Marlin. Both it, it updates uh, Marlin to what version of Marlin, Marlin is this? This is uh, 2.1.1. Uh, and I had one point something uh, on the older ones. And then the uh, computer that I had the working firmware on got stolen. And so I had to sort of go through and sort of rebuild it from scratch. So I'm still trying to like figure this out. Marlin is still something that I'm uh, only somewhat like familiar with. I'm sort of, I'm getting there. Um, but uh, I don't actually know what I'm searching for. So hopefully this will be a teachable moment. Um, if, you're, if you're watching and you do know, uh, well, it would be great if you would join my Patreon on the Discord and <laughs> tell me right now. But uh, short of that, oh, I'm sure I'll figure it out. So I'm just going to search for EEPROM. Uncomment. Enable EEPROM settings. OK, so that says that implies that there are EEPROM settings somewhere else. So we're just going to go down. Note that if EEPROM is enabled, save values will, will override these. Oh, OK. Well, then that is. This is the mo movement settings. So if you want to set the defaults in the firmware, which I do. Um, so default axis steps per unit. All right. So it's 80 and 80 um, for the X and the Y. But the Z is 400. And the E is 500. We're not going to mess with the E right now um, because that's the sort of, it, it's tricky. That's one of like the main hacks that I did to get the trash printer to work is that um, it thinks that it's using a motor to push a discrete amount of filament. Uh, and instead, it's just turning that auger. So it's a lot less, uh, it's a lot more nonlinear, less linear. Um, and uh, but it does mean that this value we know um, should be 400. So now they're all the same. And we're going to leave that one alone. Um, but we still want to enable the EEPROM settings. 
That's EPROM. So EPROM is like a persistent memory on the board. And so you can set signals over the USB interface uh, so you can set these settings um, without having to reflash the firmware. So it's a convenient um, feature to have enabled. Um, question is, what do we need to enable it? Define, saves, beep. Okay, so you can see here, whenever you see these two dashes here, or these two, where is that, forward slash, um, the, that is a comment. So this means that it is commented out. Um, and so I believe that what we have to do is just do that. And now it's a command, it's not a comment. And so a lot of Marlin is like that. It has a bunch of features that you're never actually using. Um, and um, it's, um, uh, so to enable them, you just delete the forward slashes and it, it sort of then makes it part of the code. Um, so I don't actually know, because I, I don't remember ever having to do this, uh, but I'm going to hope that that is um, a uh, thing that will fix that. I also am going to comment on here, um, changed by SS, which is my initials. And so later, uh, I can go back and search the firmware for changes that I've made from the stock version. Um, and so it's just good uh, to get in the habit of doing that. Um, okay, so it's also best, I found, to not make too many changes before you uh, test them. Because sometimes your code won't compile because you may mess something up in there and it'll be really frustrating. And sometimes you don't actually know what the effects of what you changed are. Uh, but in this case, I just changed the uh, default steps per millimeter uh, and I also change the uh, EEPROM. So let's see if that works. So the um, trash printer, the board is already connected to the computer via USB, but uh, it's connected to um, the Repetier host software so that it can talk to it. So I have to disconnect Repetier um, and then I'm going to go back to Arduino, and let's see, um, this is going to take a while. Uh, so what you have to do, first we're going to, let's see, um, this can get really tricky. Um, Darcy and I spent hours the other night trying to get this to all work right when we were building the uh, a firmware, but um, you generally, once it's working, uh, you, you will go over this later, but I'll just talk about it now. You can go to this boards manager and you can search for Rambo and you're going to install the Rambo board set. Now I'm just going to show you. Um, there, Rambo AVR boards. So you have to install this. Um, there's also another way to do it, but for now you, you, that should be enough. So then that will make it so you can actually add the correct board. And it's really important that you do that because you've got the wrong board set. Um, it will think that the pins that control everything are going to be different because all the boards are different. And you're, even if it does compile, which it probably won't, uh, you're going to have a bad time. So um, let's see. Uh, we're going to go and we're going to select the Rambo. And then we're going to go and we're going to select the port. And it should only be one of these. Yeah, COM5 Rambo. All right, we're going to select that. And then we're going to hit verify. And um, on a like deep programming level, I couldn't actually tell you what that's actually doing. Uh, but on sort of a more superficial level, it's just checking the code to make sure that it is all internally consistent and will actually run as code and not just like throw an error. Um, 
So this is just like verifying that everything uh, is operating the way that it should and will actually upload to the board properly when you're ready to do that. Um, if you just hit upload, it will compile and then upload. And when I hit upload, it will also recompile, although it will go faster the second time slightly. Um, but it's good to get in the habit of just verifying it um, before you upload it. Um, because it's very common for you to have um, left out something or messed up, put in something that is not, you know, the code that it expects, and um, it won't let you uh, upload it. So uh, now we just have to wait. So I'm going to drink some water. And while it's doing that, and while I have my screen up, I might as well just show you some other screen-related stuff. Let's see, what do we have here? So um, there are basically three programs, at least, that you're going to need in order to do this. Well, you're going to need the Marlin firmware, which is not actually a program. It's a program that runs on uh, the Arduino or on the Rambo board itself. The Rambo board is actually an Arduino Mega um, board that is then has built into the board uh, all of these extra breakouts and, and pinouts um, for controlling a, a 3D printer. So it's a uh, Arduino. Uh, this is all stuff that will be remedial for anyone who knows anything about 3D printing. And this is all stuff that I had no idea about uh, when I first started building the trash printer. The trash printer was literally the first 3D printer that I ever built, actually the first one that I ever owned. Um, and um, so I've learned pretty much everything um, from this project. And so uh, I'm hoping to make it um, accessible for other people as well. So I'm going to try and explain this as best I can. And um, also feel free to correct me wherever I'm wrong. Um, and so... Um, Arduino is a platform and a set of uh, microcontrollers, little computers, um, that can run any code you want, and you upload code to them using this uh, Arduino program uh, called the Arduino IDE. Um, and so um, you'll need that, and you'll also need Repetier Host, which is a program for controlling uh, the 3D printer. It also has an integrated um, uh, slicer program, which sometimes are an independent program. And in this case, it's an open source uh, uh, piece of software. Uh, so it integrates another piece of software called slicer, spelled with a three as the E, slice three R. Um, but it's, it's just built in as part of, of Repetier, so you don't have to download that. Um, 
But um, Repetier lets you um, place objects in the bed, and um, it lets you then run. Um, you, you can set the settings in the slicer that tell it all of the settings and the particulars of your printer so that it can generate the actual motion uh, to make it all work. And so the actual, um, usually the files that you upload to the slicer are called STLs, stereolithography files. Um, and you can find those on places like the Thingiverse. I'm also going to post some of uh, ones that I use. Hey, look at that. Um, so that just um, verified. So that means that I didn't break it when I changed those things. So now we're going to hit upload. It's going to have to compile again, but it will go faster. Um, and we're going to upload it to the board, and hopefully it will accept those. Um, and then uh, if it works, then I'll go and try and move it again, and it will um, move the X and Y a lot more uh, than it was before, uh, because it will now be at the correct uh, steps per millimeter. So here's hoping. Um, and um, so you'll upload the STLs, and you'll place them in the bed, and you'll size them however you want. Um, and you'll slice them according to certain settings. Hey, done compiling and upload. Or now it's uploading. Okay. Um, and uh, and then it will generate a G code file, which is actually the sort of language that the program speaks that tells it when, where to move, and when, and all that. Um, and um, so once you have uh, the G code. You can um, just tell it to print through up to your host. You can also use a print server called Octoprint, which we'll try and set up. And Octoprint is not necessary, but it runs on Raspberry Pi, which is a small microcomputer, a single, um, single what, what are they called, a system on chip, uh, small computer. Um, and uh, that lets you send prints to it over Wi-Fi. So it's wireless, and you don't need to be tethered. And it also has a bunch of neat features and add-ons, uh, one of which is you can set up a webcam, and it will take a, a photo every time uh, it finishes a layer. And so you get these really neat time lapses of the whole print happening. Um, and so those are really great for like um, documenting your work and like knowing what works and what doesn't so you can improve. It's also a great way um, for me to share uh, the prints that I do successfully. Because if you build this machine to the exact same specifications or close, then you actually don't need to do the slicing step. I can just share the raw G code that I know works for this machine. And if you have the same machine, you can just run the G code. And as long as you can feed it trash that's of a similar quality, um, you should get similar results. Uh, and so that'll be a really, really interesting test. Um, currently, there's only this trash printer version 3 and that printer, trash printer version 3 in the world. I'm really hoping that there will be you know, thousands uh, or more at some point. Um, but uh, and if that were the case, any successful print, any set of settings uh, that anyone makes uses to make anything useful, they can add to the library that I'm going to make on GitHub. And um, then we can all print those things out of trash. And so it's a really, really exciting uh, possibility. And um, so now I'm just talking, though, because it did upload, which is great. So now I can go to Repetier, and I can connect. All right. And so we're connected. And now it thinks the place where it started is home again, which is good because it's not right at the edge there. Um, now I have to remember, so the positive values, I always start with a small one. So first, just to see if it works. OK, makes a sound. For That's 0.1 millimeters. So that's uh, just an incredibly small distance. So that makes sense that you can barely even see it. So and this is going to be the x. Um, OK. It is doing it very fast um, because I haven't set the max speed. 
Yeah, but that's totally right. That looks like 10 millimeters to me. So that's working. All right. So now let's try. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's go the other direction. All right. You can see, uh, I need to fix this um, shaft coupler. You can see that it's a little wibbly. Uh, that's because I was trying to push it back so much that it like doesn't quite have enough of this uh, to bite on and keep it straight in there. Um, these are flexible couplings, so it makes up for that. But it's still less than ideal. So I'll go in and I'll just give myself a little bit more room on there. Um, but it works. Um, so now, let's see, I'll go over by a couple don't want to do anything that will like pull on any of the wires and then I can go back the other way and I'll do a full 50 mm -hmm. that looks great okay so now let's do that looks really good so you can set, and I probably will set in the firmware, you can set like a max acceleration uh, so that it sort of ramps up to full speed. It goes, Ooh. also, if you're really into the sound of 3D printers, which I am, um, it makes sort of like a nice uh, sort of interesting ramp up in the tone um, and just makes it so that it's less jerky, um, which if nothing else, just makes it smoother and is a little easier on all of the hardware and uh, can also just improve the print quality somewhat. Um, so that is great news. There's uh, really nothing, let's see, I'm gonna bring the Z, I don't remember, that was up. That's great. Um, so I'm gonna drop the Z down by 10. That looks great. Okay. So we almost have a working trash printer. We've got power and we've got uh, firmware and we've got our motors connected and we know they're going the right way. Um, and so the last set of things that we're going to have to do to make this all work, <laughs> now that it's working, I'm like all excited again. I've got energy for this. Uh, all right. I'm going to go, I'm going to come back. Uh, to OBS, so I'm going to, whoa, turn off the display. Okay, and we're back. So, um, we've got um, most of this stuff working now, um, and um, the next things that are going to need to happen besides the sort of wiring harness to make it all, uh, you know, not just pull itself apart when it uh, is actually running. Uh, the final set of things that we're going to need to do is <clears throat> we're going to connect these um, down here. I imagine you can't see that all that well, um, but we've got a 24 volt DC heater. I kind of changed my mind from when I started this uh, build. Um, originally, I said that I was going to use two band heaters. And um, if you use the band heaters, the band heaters run on 120 volts AC. Um, and so in order to control them, uh, we're going to use what's called an SSR, which is a solid state relay. Oh, go up, you can see that. They all look like that. Um, and um, so it's switched by a low, relatively low DC voltage, uh, and then it switches AC power. Um, and so by putting one of these in line, you can take the output from the um, heater uh, that the computer or the firmware thinks is the heated bed. This doesn't actually have a heated bed. A lot of 3D printers do. Um, but one of the other hacks that I did, like I said, I've never built a 3D printer before, so I just like worked with what was easy. I just said that it has a, ha, uh, had a heated bed, and then 
instead of using that to actually heat the bed, I used it to heat this big band heater. Uh, and that acts as a preheater and lets you get a lot more heat uh, into the end of the barrel there. So that then the tip heater uh, only has to keep the tip like just up to temperature. Um, and so um, we're going to use one DC heater and one AC heater. Uh, so it's going to be really important that you connect those uh, the right way and don't connect one to the other. Um, it's more important that you don't connect the AC band heater um, or the uh, DC heater to the uh, 120 volts AC um, than it is if you connect it to the band heater. Because if you give the band heater 24 volts DC, it'll just get kind of hot, but like uh, it, it won't have enough power to really do anything. Um, and so, but there are two different uh, forms. When I'm building a printer like this, I like to use different types of connectors um, for uh, the different parts that don't want to be accidentally connected so that I physically can't. Um, so we've got this 24 volt tip heater and then we've got a little thermistor um, that's screwed in to the hot end. Um, and that will measure the tip temperature. And then we've got another thermistor that's um, connected in between the heater band and the um, uh, barrel coupling here. Um, and that will measure what will be read as the bed temperature, um, although it'll just be that secondary heater. And then we're going to run the uh, these two wires from the um, band heater, we're going to run um, one of the wires through the AC side, which is uh, this one actually um, I'm not using because it is a DC to DC one. You need one that is um, DC to AC or is switched by DC but is made for switching to AC. Um, and so, um, but for, they look the same and the ones that I have linked in the documentation are the right ones. So, um, but, uh, we're going to connect it. So this basically is just, it's almost like a light switch that turns on and off really fast. Um, and, um, so this will just, uh, get one of the wires and we'll interrupt it. And then the other wire will go right to the neutral line. One of the, this will interrupt the live wire. Um, from the uh, AC source, and then the other one will just go directly. Um, I will make sure that I uh, both explain that better and uh, get you a better visual on that. Um, but we are very, very, very close. Um, so now I'm just thinking about, <laughs> I guess I didn't really uh, you know, think I was going to get this far. Um, the thermistor I could connect, I would just have to put a coupling on here. And it is nice because the board is moving around so that um, uh, the thermistor wire doesn't have to go very far, which was kind of the point. The thermistor wires are... Um, will be that they're, they're not polarity sensitive. You can do them anyway. You just need to connect both the wires. Um, it doesn't matter if one is positive or negative. Um, let me see if I can find um, the other end that I'll use to connect that thermistor. That should do it. All right. Okay, I never remember, let's see, on this one, it's that one or that one, maybe there's one or two. 
All right. Like I said, I'll take a photo of this when it's all set up so you don't have to like guess what I'm doing here. But Okay, and I'm not going to switch back the view, but I'm going to go back to OBS and, or uh, Repeteer, and I'm going to see if I'm getting a temperature reading now, and I am, and that was for the bed, um, and uh, and that's right. Okay, that is the correct one. I kind of guessed I knew it was one or the other, but that is the correct thermistor. So the bed is now reading the temperature. You can see that it's 25C. Um, another thing that you can do when you're testing the thermistors, obviously don't do this when the heaters are on, but before you get to that point, just to see if the thermistors are registering, you can just sort of put your hand uh, around it or on it, and you can see if you can get the temperature to go up. Um, yeah, okay, there it is. So it's going up by fractions of a degree, but definitely noticeably, and that's just because of my body heat. So that confirms that it is responding to temperature and that it's doing so very accurately. Um, it also shows that it's like pretty hot in here. Um, and um, so now the other one I don't know if I have quite enough length on this one to get from here to there unfortunately. Maybe I do. It's kind of tight. Um, this one should do it. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. And with this one, I should have done this before. Um, now I have to do it with it in place and it is possible to damage it. But I'm just going to cut off this connector here because I'm not going to use it. And then... These wire strippers don't even go that well. When do this, the bad habit uh, that I have of mine is just do it with my teeth, which uh, I don't recommend, uh, but I somehow always do. So, you know, make your own choices, live your life. Um, is that these thermistors, particularly these little ones, um, are really easy to sort of just damage. Um, so I don't really like doing it this way. Okay. So now let's see, does that reach actually? Oh, just barely, it doesn't. Okay. Let me find a longer thermistor cable. I'm sure I have one lying around here somewhere.
I got this that I could use as an extension. I don't really love that, but for testing, it's probably fine. One end. Okay. It's the other end. So now I need one more of these couplings. this around. Let's see if I can get those in there. Okay, now we have a um, tip sensor reading and a bed sensor reading. Um, and uh, they're off by a little bit. They're off by about 1.3 degrees C, uh, which, you know, um, that's a thing that you can calibrate in the firmware. You can tell it what kind of thermistor you're using and try and calibrate that. At this point, for our purposes, uh, it's fine. Um, it is a thing that's important if you want really accurate temperature control. So I'm not going to say that it's not important, um, but it's not important enough right now. And one degree of variation isn't bad, but one degree of variation uh, at room temperature um, can lead to um, way different temperature readings or wrong temperature readings uh, if you're using the wrong like, um, I forget what they're called. Uh, it uses these tables for different types of sensors so it knows what it should expect at different uh, temperatures. And if you're not calibrated to the right kind of thermistors, uh, you can be quite far off. All right, that's really exciting. The next thing that needs to happen is we need to connect the DC heater. Um, let me see if I have a connector for that. Do, but it's not quite as long as I would like it to be. <laughs> but since I only need it for this, I'm going to pull it off of here. I should probably do it. So I need to find that screwdriver. I think most of the time that I spend building stuff is actually looking for things that I have just recently put down. I don't know if that's how y'all make stuff, but but I built this, so you know it it works. And it's just tedious. All right, so um, this is the same length, so it doesn't really matter. Let's 
So this is what makes these lever connectors great. I'm just going to keep telling you how great they are until I find a reason why they're not. Um, but even if you do end up deciding to solder and do the whole thing for your heaters, um, it's um, so much easier to just be able to click these together and use whatever lengths of wire uh, to get it whatever length you need and then trim it or you know make it uh, better later. So, all right, let's see. So this is gonna go to, there's heat zero, there's heat one, and there is heated bed. So this one is going to connect directly to, let's see, make sure the positives All right, okay, the polarity is correct. That just plugs in there. This comes around here. Ooh. Um, and this one, like, um, it's just a resistor. And so if you connect it backwards, it's the same. So there is a black and a red. So there is a polarity, but it doesn't matter in this case. Um, so now power from the board is, in theory, going to the tip heater there. And if I, <laughs> I know who you are. Um, I'm live streaming right now, but I want to see you. No, yeah, come, come on, yeah, come over. Um, <laughs> All right, my friend who I haven't seen in a while is uh, just came over, so I'm going to stop this and uh, pick up. This is probably a good place to stop anyway. Uh, okay, stay tuned. It's going good. Okay. Welcome back, if anyone is ever watching this. Um, I took a little bit of a break, and I was going to call it a day. Um, but now I'm really close, and I'm kind of into it. Um, so I didn't think this is what I was going to do tonight. But I guess this is what I'm going to do tonight. Um, and um, I... Uh, need to document this, so uh, I'm just going to stream. So I'm going to try to explain what I'm doing. Um, in this part, I, um, I can talk like I know what I'm doing, and I've kind of done this before, um, but I haven't done exactly this in this exact way. Um, so this is going to be another one of those sort of figuring it out sessions. Um, but that is sort of the point of this whole stream. So hopefully, if you're willing to log, <laughs> slog through like six hours of uh, tedious building stuff and me being frustrated, um, then hopefully you will uh, be able to learn how to build the trash country yourself. Um, so now what I'm trying to do, I basically got the tip heater and the tip thermistor and the bed thermistor all set up and reading. Um, and um, I'm going to post details of the wiring later, so don't worry about that. I know you can't see it. Um, but um, the, let's see, so now the last thing is this band heater. And so what we're going to do so we're going to take this. This is the SSR. Um, and so you can see this says 24 to 380 VAC. Um, so this is for the alternating current. And all it's doing is interrupting one of the lines, like a switch. Um, and whenever it gets a signal on this side, which is a low voltage DC, 3 to 32 volts DC, we're going to give it 24 volts DC, any input like that will trigger. Uh, this switch to open and will allow electricity to pass and that will let electricity pass to the band heater um, 
as if it were being controlled like a 24 volt DC load, which is what the output on the board is designed for. So that's why you need this thing. And then, so you can switch AC. So one of these sides is going to connect to the heater and the other side is going to connect to a AC line um, that we're going to run all the way through uh, the cable guide back to here to the side and for now, we're probably just going to let it hang out in the uh, later. Um, I'm going to figure out how to uh, get a hole through some, like do some cable management so it's clean. But we're not working on clean right now. We're working on functional. So um, this, I made these holes on here in order to mount the SSR here. Um, and uh, it seems like those holes are dead on, which is great. Um, I did already tighten down the extruder, so getting a bolt in there is going to be a little tricky. But um, let's see, is that even possible? I could maybe use a zip tie. Let's see what I have. Okay, given the parts I have, I think this one is the most likely to hold that SSR in place. Let's see. Um, speaking of putting these down, all right.
Okay, that fits well. Something that I was looking into um, was potentially mounting um, the um, potentially mounting the um, SSRs on a DIN rail, a 35 millimeter DIN rail, which is like a really common um, means of uh, organizing sort of small electrical equipment like this. Um, and uh, I got some, uh, and those lever lock connectors come in DIN rail versions. Um, and so um, I don't know if it's practical, but it's something I'm working towards. Um, Okay. Uh, maybe multitasking here and not really paying attention. Um, Okay, so now this is a, I believe, M5 um, countersink bolt and nut, and it's actually holding that there great. Um, okay, cool. So I should, if I were to do this again, I would um, do this part before I put on the extruder. I can also take off the extruder, it is removable. Uh, but this is actually super secure for right now. Um, so, uh, but it would make sense to attach uh, on this other hole uh, so that, you know, it doesn't twist or something while it's printing. Um, and so that's going to connect to the heater. Like that. Or I guess we could... It doesn't really matter where it is. Um, I guess we do it like that. Okay, and we're going to use the tiny screwdriver to take off this weird, annoying ceramic wire connector. And we're just going to get to those bare wires. And then, let's see, it could just be here. Okay, so I have this. A sort of a placeholder from the old version. Um, these are um, also not polar. One side, if this is AC, uh, and you want to be a little bit more careful with AC. If you're not comfortable wiring AC, please don't based on just what I'm showing you. Um, please do your own research because it is uh, can be a lot more dangerous than low voltage DC. Um, but also it's pretty straightforward. Um, these two, um, you can see this one's acting as a bypass, and then that's going through the SSR and then out. And it creates these two lines. One is line and one is neutral, but it doesn't matter which way you connect them. Again, just because it's going through a heater, it, it doesn't matter. So um, you can hook that up any way you want. I did connect this around the stepper motor. You got to sort of like weave things around everything. All right, so let's see. That can go in there. All right. So now, if I could feed this AC, um, I can control it. I can connect the DC side now. This should fit right over here nicely and go to, let's see, um, maybe this one would be bed, heated bed. Okay, so now that SSR should be driven whenever that's, um, 
whenever the bed is turned on. So now I need cable to connect that that can handle AC. Um, one note about that is like, you can use lamp cord. This is like a relatively, this line will never carry more than like um, 30 amps. Uh, or sorry, not 30 amps. Uh, 300 watts. Um, and so um, it doesn't have to be a really like heavy gauge wire. Um, but um, if you go to the hardware store and just get lamp cord, uh, that should work just fine. And it's a good two connector um, system. So. Another really w easy way to do it um, that can be pretty clean is to just cut up an extension cord. Um, I kind of like this one here. Um, but then you have something that just has a plug at the end, and that's really handy. Um, that's probably what I should do. Um, but I need to find a uh, extension cord that I'm willing to sacrifice. You know, as I was saying that, I remembered that I have this, which I think I have for this intended purpose. Um, so um, this, these are the black and white wires, um, and you can put them in either way. Probably it makes sense. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but like I'm going to put the live side on the one going into the SSR and the neutral going to be on the other side. Okay, so now I have the ability to give this heat. It's not, well, it might actually be long enough to do the wire. Let's see if this, I don't think, not quite, but um, one nice thing about having this sort of separate input is that you can disable that heater entirely just now by not plugging it in. But you can turn on the bed heater uh, using Repetier. And um, you can see if the light, the little red light on this SSR, um, lights up. And so that's how you know it would be passing heat to the plug if the plug were plugged in. But you don't need to test that for the first time you know, uh, with it live. So, I need to grab my keyboard. And then, let's see. I move a little bit more out into the light. All right. Okay, 
it's a little bit better. It's a little dark in here. Um, so now the next test is to go back to Repetier, which should be still connected to um, here. I'm going to try and get better at sharing my screen. Maybe I can just do window capture. Bear with me for one sec. Um, Still getting the hang of. OBS. So bear with me. Hello there. You know, I'm going to try and see if I can just put this into the stream. Um, hopefully you can still see it. I am still learning how to do a good live stream here. So thanks for bearing with me. OK. I think I'm going to change this. That's a little bit better, I think. It's a little weird, but whatever. Okay. Um, maybe I can even just... You don't need that side of the frame. Okay. Hopefully this is helpful, and hopefully I can do what I think that I can do. So now I'm going to go to Repetier, and um, I'm going to... Try and turn on the bed heater. And I'm going to see if it lights up the red light on the SSR. But it's not plugged in, so I won't actually run the heater. Although, if it were plugged in, I believe that it would. So that's sort of the stage that I'm at, and that's the test that I'm doing. And it's one of the steps that I recommend that you do when commissioning the printer. Um, so let's hope things don't explode. So this is the Petunia bed. And the light on the SSR is on. Great. That is great. Um, it's also now time, I think, that I could test the actual tip heater. And it will actually get hot. Uh, or it should, because it is plugged in. So that will be a good test. And I'm just going to be looking for Actually, I'll show you. So over here, if you come over to where it says temperature curve instead of 3D view, you can pick on that or click on that, and it will give you a temperature readout, a graph over time, uh, instead of like a picture of what your empty bed is. That doesn't really matter until you have a print in it. So this can be a lot more useful information when you're just getting ready to start printing and or testing the printer when you just built it. So, um, I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to hit the um, this icon with the red line through it, and it's going to turn on the tip heater. And really, what I'm just going to check is to see if the thermistor starts going or uh, the temperature starts going up, and the thermistor reads it. I'm not going to let it get too hot. So let's try it. There it goes, and it's reading 24. Now it's going 25, 26, 28. 30. All right. So yeah, there it goes. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but you can see that graph going way up. 
All right, so that's already at 50 C. It's heating up real fast. Great. Okay, but we don't want to go too crazy. It is going to overshoot a little bit now that it's like soaked up some uh, power. And so it's best not to just leave the heaters on. I should also say that like um, when you first commission a printer, like there are firmware studies that I think can fix this, but I have not yet fixed and don't really understand. So this is another one of those things that uh, if you know how to do it, please get on the GitHub uh, and help um, make this more straightforward. But I think it has to do with the PID tuning. But the, um, the temperature sensors inside the, or the 3D printer is talking to the temperature sensors and it's doing um, PID, what, what is it? So integral derivative, uh, what's the P? I always forget. Uh, anyway, um, and um, it's, uh, it's controlling the temperature and trying to get it locked in as accurately as possible. And so, but when you first turn it on, it doesn't have any frame of reference for what uh, like full on is or what like, you know, it has no ability to modulate because it hasn't learned that yet. So when you first commission uh, the printer, the heaters will often get really hot um, and the first time before they cycle a little bit. Usually it's only for like a little while, but that's also the time when if you just put together your nozzle, any oil or anything that was on those parts, you know, the first time it gets hot will also come off. Um, and usually it's not like billowing smoke or anything, but it can be a little bit smelly. And uh, proper ventilation for that first time is, it's important all the time, but it's most important then. It's something to consider. Um, after it learns kind of what to expect from a heater and a thermistor, it kind of like knows the feedback loop that really will control that temperature sensor well. Um, it, uh, it's a lot more accurate and doesn't have those huge um, temperature spikes. Um, okay, so I mean, shit. The next um, test is to give that power. Um, but I'm using it to power the power supply. So I need a different extension cord. Okay, so I've got an extension cord. I need to plug it into an outlet. Okay. 
So now I should be able to connect this to this, and nothing should happen. Um, I'm going to actually, let's see, I've got a smart plug. This is something that I recommend you get, but it's totally optional. Um, this is a smart plug. It's a Shelly smart plug. It doesn't really matter which ones you use. So I got these because they talk to Home Assistant, apparently. I haven't figured that out, or figured that out. But in theory, I should be able to use this to um, monitor the net power of the trash printer in total. And if you do that, it, it gives you a graph. And it tells you how much power you use over a certain length of time. And you can match that with the time it takes to print something. And then you know the energy cost. And so, for example, I've calculated roughly that the current iteration, at least for the parts that I calculated, was operating in the ballpark of one watt hour per gram, um, which works out incredibly nicely to one kilowatt hour per kilogram. Um, that wind turbine that I printed um, was probably the largest part that I've ever printed. And um, it um, actually like broke because the extrusion got kind of thin. I realized later that I'm using kind of a tight nozzle on that one. Um, so I'm using a bigger nozzle, a considerably bigger nozzle on this one. And so this half broke off. Um, but when it was all together, it was 700 grams. Um, and so that means if you can do a kilowatt hour per kilogram and one full wind turbine, because that didn't go the full height. So at least half to a wind turbine that is all the way down there. And the taller it is, the more power it can, you know, generate. Um, one of those per day powered by the amount of power that comes out of a single three to 400 watt modern solar panel um, over the course of an average day in most climates. Uh, in Portland in the winter, that's definitely not the case. Maybe you get like an eighth of a turbine. But um, during the time where there is sun in Portland, like right now, um, or anywhere where there's sun, um, one trash printer, one solar panel, one wind, wind turbine per day, as long as you have trash to feed it. So it can be powered entirely by trash and sunshine. And I think that's pretty neat. Um, and so um, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to mount a solar panel up here and have a battery and like test it out. Uh, but first I have to build it. So this is on. I'm gonna see if I can connect to it with the app. Let's see. Um, okay, well, and it sees it, I think. And then if I turn it off, does it do anything? Okay, so I can control it, and um, it's reading zero watts. So I'm going to put my phone right there, and I'm going to plug this in. And it shouldn't do anything, because that switch is not connected. But um, the other reason that I think these things are neat is they've got an electronically limited circuit breaker in there. So as long as you don't have like an incredibly high amp spike, um, or even if you do, when it hits 15 amps, it'll cut off electronically. So it's not a breaker necessarily, but it is a protection system that will stop the circuit if it doesn't perform the way that it's supposed to. So it, it's an easy uh, way to be safer. Um, and also it tells you your energy consumption and they're not very expensive. So um, now that that is on, I can Turn on the outlet, still reading zero watts, that's great. And now, if I go over to Repetier, I should be able to hit the bed temperature and have it do the exact same thing. It should start heating up uh, pretty rapidly. Um, 
and uh, I probably won't do a full run. I don't recommend heating up the elements to full heat uh, until you've got some plastic in there. Uh, I don't know if it really matters, but that's sort of been my process. Okay, let's see if this works. It's going up. 35, 38, 43, 48, 54. So it's going up fast. If you, I don't know if you can see that graph because I know the screen is small, uh, but you can see over here it's heating up super fast. Uh, just shooting. Um, you can hear it sizzling a little bit, which is that uh, effect that I mentioned before. And there's a little bit of smoke. Um, so, you know, it's already up at 200 C, which is uh, plastic recycling temperature. So, um, again, I should have thought this through a little bit more. Do as I say and as I do. Please don't be like me um, because uh, it's a little, you can see a little bit of smoke coming off of it right now. Um, so, but it is connected and it is hot and that is all great news. So it may almost be ready to eat some trash. And that would be the first extrusion. Um, I do want to figure out some firmware stuff. What was the thing? Um, one thing I didn't test was the, uh, just real quick, I want to see how much power that takes. 365, 400 watts, uh, let's see, 400 watts. So that's a lot more powerful than the other one that I was using. Um, and I just got these ones on Amazon. They're a little bit different than what I have been using, but I think they look better and are better for a couple of reasons. Uh, the other ones that I brought on Amazon aren't always available also. Um, and, um, but I think they look better. So there's that. Um, and so the smaller one, I believe, was 130 watts. And let me see. Yeah, so this one's 130 watts. That's, I think, 360 or 380 watts. Rated at 380 watts. Um, so you could get a um, dimmer module uh, that's made for dimming like incandescent lights. Uh, make sure that it can control load above 400 watts or around 400 watts, at least 400 watts. And um, you could dial it down so that it's not actually getting full power. So it won't take all of that uh, because it probably is more than you need. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you're here, um, but like previously this printer, uh, the max like wattage that I ever saw at peak to was somewhere around 250 watts. Um, so that wattage is kind of a lot. It'll even out as soon as it starts heating up and getting modulated um, by the uh, control board. But um, it may also make sense to dim it or just use one of these. Um, I realized that that one, if you squeeze it really tight, fits a little out around, or around the fitting that I wanted it to fit around. Uh, but also this smaller one does as well if you bend it out. So both the big one and the small one work. So um, we'll see um, if that heater is, for whatever reason, too powerful. Uh, we've got options. So. I think I do need to do some cable management. I also really want to get to first extrusion. Um, I also really want to get it some light.
Okay. Let's start with the light part. Um, get our priority straight. Uh, I need an outlet with USB. I know that I had one at one point. monitor. Cool. I'm going to hide Repetier for now. Cool. And then I was thinking about using these, this cable entry. Um, so you have like a nice plug on the side. And then one of these will control the 24 volt power supply which will then also feed a uh, five volt power supply for running lights in the Raspberry Pi. Um, and then the other one is left free to connect to the heater. So this will be the total input. And I don't want to like cut it up and put it in there yet, but I'm going to disconnect power so that I can put this and have two plugs. Um, is a really basic wiring for power. And then I'm just going to sort of hardwire the um, LEDs. Let me see if this works. This is just like a really simple adhesive LED strip you can get from Ali or, um, Amazon. And um, it's good, I think, to be able to light the whole thing up. And this length kind of goes at least, I know it kind of went around the other one, but I think it would go all the way around. And so I'm going to pick a corner. Um, and I'm probably going to want to like put some strain relief in there. I think it wants to go like there, uh, which means I think the bed wants to go down. Um, And I, if I remember correctly, oh, I also disconnect. I need to disconnect because it lost power, so it probably reset it anyway. Okay, there's all my stuff. Great. And I believe Z was this way. Or no, it was down, wasn't it? 
Oh, that's not C. <laughs> Okay, that's down. So I'm just going to lower this. Probably to be Okay, I'm going to see if I can find my favorite piece of hardware, which is a binder clip, um, and use that to clip the light in place. Oh, there's a couple. I mean, I knew I had them somewhere. Use this to clip the light wire in place. I think one of these small ones should work. And then something like in there. So it's going to be something like. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. We'll figure out that part later. But then this is held mostly in place. There is adhesive on here, but uh, it can be kind of tricky to get off. Um, let me see if I can. It can be hard to like get it apart in a way. It, it's possible to like peel the adhesive. Okay, that part came off. Um, I think. Okay, this adhesive is actually pretty strong. So, I'm going to lower the bed more. All right, so, um, for reference, moving the bed down uh, at the fastest rate that this allows is 10 millimeters. And so, if you do it, click it 10 times, uh, it will move roughly, uh, uh, what, 100 millimeters, uh, which is roughly 4 inches. So I know that I have at least four inches there, so I'm just going to click this maybe like 15 times. Now I'll make it a lot easier to get in there. Okay.
This probably would have been easier to do earlier in the build. So just uh, make a note of that. Jot that down. The cleaner you do your cutting job, the cleaner this line will be. All right. Well, that looks cooler than I had hoped. This might just be the perfect life, which does happen, but happens rarely. And when it happens, you know, you should savor it. Oh, I guess I should wait until I'm right at the end, but that is incredible. That's like one. So one of these strands is, I believe, two meters. Um, but it overlaps in there perfectly and makes one seamless light bar for the whole thing. That looks awesome. <laughs> cool. All right. So priorities. Um, I'm a little blind now. Um, but let's see. I can't actually see what that looks like. Cool. All right.
Okay. And then, let's see. I'll just put down my keyboard somewhere. Hmm. I've also got a light ring that would look really awesome on there. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure how I'd mount it right now. So maybe that's not a now problem. Um, I guess like there is some concern about putting too much weight on the bed. Uh, and I am adding a number of things. None of them are particularly heavy. Um, but I'm adding the control board and the SSR. Um, and uh, I don't know how that will affect it. So... Um, I try to do things exactly the same, and sometimes I can't help myself, but like uh, trying something new every time I build. So you got to try. Um, I love how clear it makes everything, though. That's going to look really good. OK. Um, it's going to look so good, in fact, that I'm going to take some pictures. Doesn't look good.
So that's great. Um, this over here. I think it's ready to test. So I'm going to go over. Um, I'm going to go to Rocketeer. You don't need to see this part, but I'm going to move it. I'm going to go to manual control. And then I'm going to move it. I'm going to remember which way is which. Okay, that way is that way. So I want to go that way. That's really rough. Uh, yeah, I need to work out something there. Sometimes if they're off too, they can sort of fight each other. So you do want to make sure these ones look pretty good on. You'll get a good sense for what the holding torque of the stepper motors is when you do that. Um, Let's see. Cool. And then we're going to move this. See which way is which. Hit one. Okay, that's that way. That's the way I wanted to go. Okay, now it's pulling. So I'm going to make sure that we don't move cables too much. That looks great. Cool. All right. And so now we have to feed it some plastic. Um, so this stuff. Hmm. They say it's HDPE, but I think that's wrong. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure this is test tube polypropylene. Um, but it's important to uh, label your stuff um, when you're working with plastic. But some of these fragments seem a little bit big, but most of them seem pretty good. This seems pretty primo. Uh, I've become a uh, plastic uh, connoisseur. Um, What's really nice, this is, these are the test tubes that I've been printing most of my stuff with. Anything that looks kind of like this uh, was printed with this as the feedstock. Uh, and except for this, which is when I added in biochar from my biochar reactor to see what it would do. And it stains it black and makes it more UV resistant. Um, and also sequesters a tiny little bit of carbon. Um, and uh, but so this stuff is really great and it's sort of um, industrial. Waste. It would have still gone in the landfill, um, but uh, but it's not post-consumer. It doesn't have like food bits or whatever. 
These come from a company in Oregon that tests wine. Um, and so they have these single-use polypropylene test tubes that they can only use once because if it's few of the results, they use them again. And so they just produce like so many of them. And so they wash them and give them to the trash hackers uh, for free. And there's sources of industrial plastic waste like that all over. So the trash vendor, but like I started with that and I was like, okay, well that's sort of trash. Um, but that's not the same as like real actual trash. And that bin of real actual trash is over there. Um, so, but because this is a new extruder and because it's a new printer, um, it makes sense to start with the stuff that I know that is good. Um, and if you can get a source of something really clean, this particularly polypropylene, and use that as a base, you can sort of add it in 50-50, you know, 30, 70 or whatever, add it into really low grade plastic, um, and it'll give it like a nice sheen and make it flow better. Um, because when you print with only um, takeout containers and stuff, you get these really rough sort of weird uh, prints that are okay. I mean, like, and I think that I could have made this um, fully stick together, um, but the quality is just not great. So it's good for structural parts, um, but um, if you can get something clean, you can get these really cool clear effects. And so that's great for LED lighting, all sorts of diffuse lighting. Um, and, uh, but you can also just mix it in and make things print easier. Um, and uh, without further ado, All right, so we got a little bit of plastic in there. And then I'm going to What I'm going to do is I'm going to Google what the G code is uh, to disable the cold extrusion prevention checking that's built in as a safety measure to the firmware. And so what that does is it makes it so that you can't move the extruder motor unless the nozzle is hot. Um, and so that just makes it so that if the, because when the plastic re-solidifies, it locks in place. And so uh, it can damage the machine, it can damage the extruder. Um, and so, uh, but for testing, I want to push material down to the very tip so that it can melt there. Um, and um, so it also like, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna run the extrusion motor um, like uh, enough to um, push a little bit of the material down there before I get it hot. I am realizing that like I probably should have tested the um, uh, extruder motor, but this is as good a time as any. Um, so I need to turn it in a way that pushes the material down. And uh, so what I need to do, I'm just going to run, I don't think you can see this, but whatever. Um, so, um, let me see here, I'll do, um, G code, um, enable hold extrusion. M302, cold extrude. All right, what is the description? Sets the minimum temperature, potentially allowing E movement at temperatures below the melting point of the material. Okay. So, M302 reports the current cold extrusion state. And then M302 S0 would always allow cold extrusion, um, which is kind of what I want. 
Um, and then I can re-enable it with M302P0. Okay, I can do that. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here, and there's a place in here where you can just give it G code. So G code is very simple. So that's the command. M, I might as well capitalize it, clarity. M302, um, and then S0. Uh, and I'm going to send that. And then it may let me use the extruder motor, but I don't know. So let's find out. Oh, it does something. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Um, so I always forget which way I want it to go. So this way would push it down. Okay, so it's going the right way. It's always good to have like a spare auger for reference. Um, so that's going the right way. Now we need to make it go faster. So, um, oh, there's also this. Wait, was that, that was back? Let me see. In this direction, that's an upward motion, that's the downward motion. So the stepper is backwards. Um, and the easiest way to fix that, you can fix it in the firmware, you can do whatever. If you find that problem, you can just flip it around. Um, I find it's the most easy and effective and quick. Um, but if you do it all the time, you will sort of eventually wear out your headers. Um, but for now, whatever. So I think that's right. Um, this should now turn that way. All right, can confirm. OK. So now I'm going to try and do it for a length of 10 millimeters is what it thinks it's feeding. That looks great, and it does seem to be feeding the material. Okay, but I want it to go faster, and there's this option over here. Um, all right, now that I'm in it, I am going to enable um, number here for um, reference. So. Okay. What's going on in Repetier is mostly happening over here. So now you can see. So um, I'm over here and I'm playing with the extrusion. And so I'm going to tell it to do 50 millimeters of uh, material. And it's just going to go, actually, let's, let's just do 100. And it's just going to go that way for a while. And that should help to feed material down into the barrel. Ideally, you'll see material kind of forming a you know, funnel as the other material below it is pushed down into the barrel. And eventually, if you keep doing that, the motor will probably jam because it will be filled with material. But I want to get to that point faster, so I'm going to see what the fast extrusion setting over here does. That looks great. Uh, and I can keep doing that. And it appears to be working. But um, I want to be able to do that faster. And so now we'll see if the EEPROM, haha, yeah, okay. So that thing did successfully enable EEPROM. -E um, and uh, now you can see that the um, default steps per millimeter that we put into the firmware in Marlin are now here because that's burned into the memory 
but it's um, it's memory that you can get access to through the USB. I don't actually really understand how it works. Um, and uh, But you can program it from the computer and don't have to reflash. And so that makes it really great for tuning in the feed rates. Um, and I will pull these up, actually, from what I have on here uh, at some point and um, you know, take a um, screenshot so that it, we know what we're working with. But um, the important ones are actually, I can also slow the x-axis. Oh, I can do all these things. Maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, OK. You can, let's see. The important thing is the e-axis resolution right now. If we make that like a thousand, I think it'll go faster. Um, I hope people who know what they're doing are like laughing at this because uh, this is how I've gotten this thing to work is just hacking on it this way. And uh, <laughs> so, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> please help me. Um, Okay, max speed rate is way too high, I think. Um, but if, if the speed was fine, I guess, it was more the um, acceleration. So I don't actually know the millimeters per second. Um, I have these in the email. You know I'll mess with those later. Um, okay. So I'm going to change the e-axis resolution to 5, or to 1,000. And this max e-axis speed rate, I, don't, I want it to be able to go fast. But let's see what happens if we change that to 8. OK. So now I'm going to export this. And you have to do this. You have to send it to the printer so they can update that thing. Oh, wait, no, that's safe. That's different. Um, no, I guess you just have to say OK. That's what it is. Um, so you can do that. Um, go back to up here. And let's see if that changed how the extruder moves. Oh yeah, that's way faster. So yeah, now we're talking. All right, so that's that's much more like a, the performance that I've been getting on the other printer. You can usually tell by the pitch of the motor uh, how happy it is. Um, and there's a point where it will eventually stall. Um, that seems pretty good. I wonder what the multiplier looks like. Yeah, you can hear the difference. It's possible to play to like program your 3D printer to like play happy birthday uh, just using the tones that the um, motors produce. Um, I've always wanted to do that. They did that on the Mars rover. Um, so if anyone knows how to do that, generate a G code that like makes it play something. <laughs> Add it to the GitHub. OK, so that's great. I kind of do want to go a little faster just to like um, see what that's like. I want to have options here. OK, so I'm going to change this. I have it most recently on the other printer, I believe, somewhere around 1,600. Um, because you're not actually feeding filament. Um, it thinks that you are. It thinks that it's pushing a spool. And really, it's just pushing the auger. And so um, it's uh, you have to sort of trick it that way. That's another way that I hacked it. It's another way that if you know how to do this better or could program that in a way that's more tuned to this machine, it would probably go a long way. Um, it's just that I know that doing it this way works well enough to do all of this stuff. Um, and. Um, so let's see. Um, let's try that. Oh, <laughs> I was moving to Z. I was like, why isn't that moving? OK, so that's an unhappy motor. So that's how we know we've gone too far. So we're going to go to back here, and we're going to change it from 1,600 to like, let's call it, let's settle on 1,200 and see if we're still fast. OK, motor, what you got for me? I'm going to do only one. OK, that's good, but it is fast. You can see it's a lot faster. 
So, but it is the speed that I want. And this is um, a 15 to 1 reduction. I started uh, with a regular um, NEMA 23, and then I moved up to a 5 to 1, and then I moved up to a 15 to 1. Um, and it does, it depends on the size of your auger and the rotations and whatever. Um, but basically, this is what I do is I just like see how fast it moves based on what the firmware is like, and then I adjust the EEPROM settings for the um, E resolution until it makes the motor move basically as fast with a little as possible with like a little bit of wiggle room so it doesn't overheat or overload. Um, but uh, but that will move a lot of material and still have a lot of torque because the motor is moving really fast. So uh, I'm going to try out 1200 and see if we're still correct. Hey motor, what's up? All right, all right. So uh, how about you go 10 millimeters? Yeah, okay. How about you do that like 100 millimeters? Yeah, okay. And it is moving material. Um, so that was with the regular one. Um, and now I'm going to try fast. First at one millimeter. Okay, because it'll buzz you. It'll go zzz if it doesn't like it. So let's try 10. That's really great. Now let's try 100 at that. Basically, I can just keep doing that until like, I see material moving into the barrel um, and uh, I see a sort of like a funnel being produced uh, as material gets pushed down in there. Um, And then we take a photo. And generally, now that we know that it's feeding, um, it's safe to give it a little bit more plastic because the pressure of the plastic in the hopper helps move all of the material down. And so it helps to have a relatively full hopper and have the material way back there. Um, Okay, I think we're getting close to the first extrusion. Oh, yeah. Sorry, robot. Sometimes you just have to wait for that to be over. Um, sometimes you have to emergency stop. So, what I think happened there is that, like, um, we added more material. It, had, uh, it was right at the top of what it could move. So let's see if we're still friends. Oh, and we're not because it got reset. So cold extrusion. So I need to say M302 shift or S0 send. It's kind of like the pseudo command. How about you do this? Okay. So. Interesting. Okay, this one I like. So I think we need to go slower. I also did like, uh, see if it goes up. It can go up, 
but then it binds when it goes down, which usually means that the barrel is now full of material. Um, and it may behave differently when um, it's heated up. So, but I want to do that basically until it jams so that I know that it's packed full with plastic. And now I know. So, um, the bed heater, I'm going to have to open the door for, um, but um, it's, uh, it really only has to do that once. Um, and uh, we'll see how well that thermistor and PID tuning do. Um, And I'm going to set the temperature uh, goal low for that. I'm going to set it to like 170 and start there. Um, and then you're not going to turn on the nozzle. And I'll turn the nozzle down to like 265. Um, and I won't really heat up the nozzle until uh, the bed temperature is so you can see that the uh, temperature on that is shooting up. And um, we'll see how uh, smoky it gets. Um, oh, that was interesting. OK, stop that. So it's interesting. It got hot, and the metal expanded. And I hadn't tightened it down enough. So it um, fell off the fi fixture. Um, so that's pretty interesting. I don't love that. Those things seem fine, but still. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what do I want to do about this? Um, this? This is a time where it's good to have like an oven mitt or. Um, a uh, silicone glove. One thing I don't like about these is they just use a bolt, so you have to tighten them on both sides. Um, let's see. Let's see. that up into place. And then get it into the position I want. And then see if I can get this tightened. But the problem is, is that it's a nut on the other side. Basically, the problem is that I need three hands. But I was able to balance that. This is not part of the plan. I need to have that thermistor in there. Otherwise, this whole thing doesn't work. So.
think we're in business. Put that, put that guy where it needs to be. So now we've got that. So now I think I can. So these are new Peter bands, new to me. So what I did was I failed to tighten it down uh, enough for it to stay where it's supposed to be. So my bad. Um, something that's a lot easier to do when the thing is not already hot. Um, but that will do it. That will also improve the heat transfer. I wasn't really thinking about that. Um, it's interesting. You can see that there are some flakes. I guess most of those are probably just ones that I dropped. But um, I think we can get extrusion tonight. Um, let's see. Hmm. All right. So. Gonna go back to Repetier. I'm gonna try and let that heat up again. I'm gonna set the set point real low this time. Let's just try and get to. It's good to work your way up. I think it sort of attunes it to the motor or the heater. Um, it seems to be secure. And the thermistor is in there, and the other thermistor is there. Um, so I think I can do that. OK, and the temperature is going up. It's not on fire yet, which is cool. We'll see how much it overshoots. So we were shooting for 92, and it's already at 130 uh, C and rising. So that's what I'm talking about, the way that it just sort of flows past where it's supposed to be. Um, now it's cooling off. It, it's like someone described this one time as like, driving a car as fast as you possibly can, and then when you get to a stop sign, hitting the brakes, coming, skidding all the way to the stop, and then putting in reverse and going reverse backwards the same way, just back and forth, like skidding past the finish line. Um, and what PID tubing does is it learns that overshoot and corrects for it until it can hold a very uh, stable temperature. And that's like, I don't know, it's cool, it's math. <laughs> Um, and it's a cool, useful application of, um, what is that, calculus? I don't, I don't know. Um, and um, it, uh, it makes it so we can control heaters with extreme precision with a system like this. And when you're working with plastic, um, you're, like, you're melting it, but ideally you're not burning it. Uh, in fact, while we're waiting for this to heat up and stabilize at the temperature that I want, Let's talk about plastic. So the plastic that we're printing with is polypropylene. And this is a propylene monomer. Um, and so these are carbon atoms. And these are hydrogen atoms. And so it's just this really simple hydrocarbon. And then I don't actually know which way, but they basically make a long chain that sort of goes like this, and then like this, and then like this, and then like this, or something like that. Um, and so you get this backbone of carbon. 
And it makes basically like a molecular spaghetti um, or hair filament um, on, on a you know, molecular scale. And so the reason that plastic acts like plastic is that uh, below a certain temperature, those strings bind together, kind of like felt. Um, it's like you have a bunch of strands and you work them together and then you let them, um, you know, contract and they weave together. That's the point. That's basically what's happening with plastic. Plastic is attracted to other plastic uh, via weak uh, van der Waals forces. And so below a certain temperature, they're kind of locked into place. And then above a certain temperature, they can sort of like flow uh, past each other. And that's what gives plastic its plasticky properties. The longer you, the chain, unbroken chain per you know molecule of uh, material, generally the higher grade it is. Um, that's sort of what high density poly polyethylene and low density polyethylene. The difference is the lengths of the chains and the way that they branch. Um, polypropylene has a longer, more continuous um, uh, strand to the molecules and therefore is stronger. And then there's actually a type of plastic called UHMW or something like ultra high molecular weight uh, polyethylene. And that's what's used on the bottom of snowboards and on the sides of boats for skids. It's extremely self-lubricating. And the uh, molecule lengths, I forget what it is, but it's something like 5,000 carbon atoms long or something like something ridiculous. Um, and uh, it has these really interesting properties. Uh, and people who shape snowboards or skis make a bunch of shavings of it. So if you can figure out how to 3D print it, uh, that would be really cool. Um, so let's see. We have hit the temperature that I wanted. Um, so now we're going to let it heat up to a hotter temperature. I'm going to pick 180. And sort of what we're looking for is um, a like ability to steadily hold the temperature. Um, now, I feel like the temperature is rising. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be looking at. I mean, the bed is this one in theory, but that's not what I'm seeing here. Um, so I don't really know what I'm seeing on the graph. I go, oh, this is the bed, I guess. Um, but I don't want that really. Um, this is the bed. I see. <laughs> I'm colorblind, so, you know, bear with me. I wish I could make this. I wonder if I can. Um, I want to make it bolder. Um, Okay. Don't think so. So it is starting to smell. It is that. And it is hot, but not too hot. And it's currently. So that's interesting. It, um, material just fell out of the nozzle uh, down, which means it's heating down and uh, heating up. I wonder if I can move the extruder now. Well, it's not hot enough to melt. It's right around the temperature. Um, polypropylene starts to melt, I believe, somewhere around 210. And I usually start printing around 265, and sometimes I have to really crank it. Um, but that's usually because my there's just like a temperature correction error in my things, or have been in the past. So um, <laughs> it's mostly a neat problem. Um, so that's looking pretty good, though. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this to like 230. Do that. And it's going to shoot way over, and it's going to get hot real quick. Um, 
And while we're doing that, I'm going to try and move the extruder uh, and see if it's loosened up a little bit. Let's start with one. Okay, that moves. That's cool. Oh, that doesn't. So you can see it's like, it almost does, and then it doesn't. Um, I think I'm going to slow it down a little bit. I think that's a little too close to its max. Um, and then maybe that I need more speed. I might, let's see, I think this one's slower. I might need to go back to the 5 to 1 um, because I'm using a different auger because the way that you pick an auger changes the amount of material that's moved per revolution. Uh, and that's something you just have to sort of tune. I know that the wood auger has worked well enough. Um, and I've been trying out different ones, but I haven't really found a you know, clear, they all work, uh, or I've tried a lot of them that have worked. Um, one thing I have learned is that you want the um, like auger bit to not be exactly the width of the barrel. Um, because in my experience, the bits will get stuck in that piece in between and will make it bind more often. So it's like it's good to give it a little room. Um, and so, sure, smells like a trash printer. Um, but that's that's that you know thing that I was talking about. It heats up for the first time, so it is holding that temperature really nicely. Well, almost. It's getting there, um, but it is settling. Um, and uh, you basically like we're just trying really to not go over 300 degrees. 300 degrees is kind of like it'll burn out your thermistors, it starts burning material. Um, and so sometimes I push 300C when I'm printing, when I'm doing volume. Um, but that's not the actual temperature that, that is reaching the plastic. Um, and um, anything above 300C is just no bueno. Um, something I learned also uh, about um, HDPE, uh, I forget what I was printing it at, but like it turns out it, it extrudes basically the same no matter what temperature you're at, so you might as well not get it super hot. I tried to print it at like 270 or 280 or something like that, and then I posted about it and people were like, nah, <laughs> like, you know, you can do something like 215 or 230, uh, and I tried it and it worked the same, except it wasn't as like crazy hot. Um, and uh, HTPE, at least like milk jug HTPE, the stuff that I was using, um, it prints like old stiff toothpaste. Uh, it always has that consistency, and it's really not like nice, but you can print stuff with it. You can print stuff that's really strong. I don't know if I have any of those example prints. Uh, Okay, well, for another day. Um, okay, so the bed temperature is locked in. Uh, it's supposed to be 228. Um, I think I can turn on the tip heater now. Um, and we're going to set the tip temperature to 265. Shooter's at 260. That's looking okay to me.
All right, now I'm going to try to move the Z or extruder. And I'm going to do that until it binds or until it extrudes. When it gets hot enough, eventually gravity will just push the material down. Um, but we'll see how much extrusion we can get. All right, I'm going to do it faster. OK, that's a lot faster. Oh, you can see it. You see like a plug of plastic coming out or something. Oh yeah. I'm just gonna <laughs> Y'all gotta see this. Oh no, it fell on my phone. Um, <laughs> that was kind of what I was expecting to happen, but also. Oh, fuck it.
All right, so I'm going to up the tip temperature so that it flows a little more. I'm going to go up to 275 and see how that changes the flow rate. Oh yeah, you can see there's a much bigger bead of plastic now. So that's like a much faster extrusion. You can see that. That's like real plastic. Um, seems to be fine falling on my phone, and it's a great shot. <laughs> That's so cool. Okay, now I'm going to take my thumb back. Luckily, uh, it was fine. <laughs> um, that's really funny. All right, and like when it's this far down, it's mostly um, connected, or it's mostly um, cool by the time it comes down. Ooh, but this still very hot in some places. Um, if you're watching this, and if you build a trash printer, you will probably have the urge to touch hot plastic. And while I do it all the time, I really invite you to be prepared for that to really hurt or um, just not be good. Um, because plastic, when it's soft, it sort of feels like, I don't know, it's like it feels like a material you can just mold. It's like you want to move it around and it's 265 degrees. It will give you a burn immediately. Um, and so it's just too hot to touch uh, for more than a second. Um, sometimes you can poke at stuff. I really recommend that you don't, or you get like silicone like fingers or gloves or like high temperature gloves that are dexterous. Um, and uh, yeah, protect yourself. So now we have what sort of looks like fishing line, which is not a 3D print, but is the one of the requisite steps to 3D print. Um, so now that we're doing that and we know that it extrudes, you can't really like, based on how fast it's extruding when there's nothing under it, it's a little harder to sort of like immediately correlate that to how it will perform when it's against the layer. Because what you're going to want to do is get really flat, clean layers that can build up. They're just going to have a very thick wall. All right. so. Turning off the, <laughs> whoa, come on. That's, that is so crazy. All right. <laughs> plastic. It's like plastic. So you can keep this stuff. All right. That's recording. And so hopefully, if you hit that temperature, You can see it's sort of leveling out there, but it's not quite at the target. It's getting there. It's going to heat up.
And the bed's starting to heat up, and I can't tell if it's on. I guess I can check the SSR. The SSR is on. The bed should be heating up. Oh, but the heater is not plugged in for the... But I can plug it in. And then it will heat. Alright, so now the bed should get really hot really fast. Yep, there it goes. Then we just gonna go back. It's heating up. See it then? I wonder if I can while it's doing that. Can I breathe? No. I'm gonna turn that off. So if I wanna raise the bed I have to do it manually. But it's leveling out. And when it levels out, it gets up to temperature within the set parameters for the PID. It's going to start printing in theory. Just reset the target for the nozzle for actual printing and raise the bed too. It's going to get there. It should start moving soon. Oh, <laughs> 